So hello everyone and welcome back to Morrowind with some more well, some more Morrowind here on Twitch and also later on in YouTube. Yes. Good. Then it's been nice there, Jim Jim. Good. I I'm loading a position, not actually from the exactly the spot that we were in before. I've gone and bought a couple of more things for our apartment and I bought a set of books and such things. Haven't done anything otherwise, but I thought that it would be okay that I would go and just buy a couple of more things and organize a couple of more things. I put razor blooms there and there's a Mehrun's razor down here. Could do with a little less pollen in there. Oh. That's a shame if you have allergy with that as a problem, for sure. I don't have any allergies of a like, so it doesn't really bother me, but very annoying if it does. <laughs> yes, interior decoration to the max. Did you have a look into a stream last time? Later on, how I decorated the place a little bit, with the help of the stream uh, chat, regardless. But yes, there's the Mehrun's Rager. I want something else here. But maybe we're gonna get something that I would like. I also put some below enter here. And uh, I put some classes like this at least in here. Glass pot I didn't change yet. Oh, and I added some lights. There's a candle amethyst. This is the candle that was here already before. There's also a candle stick pewter over here. I need more stuff here, of course, but at least it's something. You did to some extent, <laughs> at least enough to be familiar with the actual structure. Alrighty, but yeah. Those are all there. Uh, but uh, then I changed quite a bit over here. I bought myself a loot. I, I gotta have a loot, you know. Then there's all the dance in fire chapters here, so that we can be reading them at some point. Gotta have all of them. There's seven books of them anyway, so that... We'll take a moment to read through, nonetheless, even though they are, none of them is as long as the, well, the other series. Then some silverware, a cast, a picture, a quoma eggs in this lovely decorative uh, bowl, uh, just a little bit of a bread, rat meat and sauce in the plate, ready to be eaten. A game, a theater book needs to be here because, well, it's a very fitting name after all. After all. And of course, I loved... This, this is just some spa spare silverware here, if we happen to get any quests uh, appearing. And I like this kind of bar pewter to give us light over here, for sure. So, those sort of things. Um, I can't have a Morrowind home without a loot. Ah, yes, that's why. Mm, how else would you entertain uh, visitors? Yes, very much indeed, true. How else would we do it? How else would we ever? And then I have a little candle amethyst over here. And a candle emerald over here. Still the full queen books over here. I also added the Chronicles of Shnuleft and the Tumor Scarab Schematics over here. So we can easily go and see, see it here. As such, this is something that uh, one guy asked for us to also bring them, but to be honest, I like it on myself, so I would prefer to keep it myself and not be giving it out. But it was very important to get some candles over here. Because, well, otherwise this area was so dark. So very, very dark. Might need even more candles around the place. Wouldn't be the worst idea. To even maybe have some candles, like, yeah, on the way. By the way, is the volume good as it is? Or not. I didn't get any more amethyst ones, unfortunately. Didn't. I don't think there was enough of them. These are very greeny lights, these emerald ones, of course. But there could be some, like, in here. See more. And then in here to light up the way downstairs when we happen to have more in there. I think that looks pretty nice. A little bit of an entrance lightning as well and everything. And uh, don't tell one of us like the dark. Well, maybe, but I like candles. So that's that's just 
my opinion. Have a little bit of a light in the place. Just a little bit. It's not like it's a lot when you have a couple of candles around the place. For some reason, these candles don't have a light in them, which sucks. So, I have abandoned them. That there trick to completely dark. Needs to be abandoned somewhere. There's one more emerald. Is something that I can, of course, leave here somewhere. Just a question, where? Um... I say that, but all the visas we visited have had really well lit homes. Yeah, that's the thing that I was thinking that... Do you think that those places were really dark previously? And there's, after all, already these lovely lanterns here that are lighting up the place. I really like them, these lanterns that we have, sort of. <sighs> I think this is a very... This is a lot nicer kitchen table for us, I'd say, and uh, this is uh, something that we have decorated ourselves to be the way it is. So I'm quite happy with that. Quite happy. Let's see. Should I leave you here? Maybe a little bit more light into the darkness. Well. Uh, did I start recording? Yes, I, I'm certain that I did start recording. Well, I have to just take the stream um, up then if I didn't for some reason, but uh, maybe we should be starting with reading some books. Considering I did go and buy the full A Dance in Fire series, so what do you say, Jim Jim? Importantly, where's your junk room? Well, I don't think there's yet a junk room. There's a chest here, though, where we put something that I don't want to sell, but don't want to be carrying around either. So, some stuff here. I could be going and actually getting rid of these journeyman calculators, because it's not like I wanted them to be here, but I just didn't bother to be picking them up for now. And one extra silverware cup, some, some nice books that we had, and all that. <laughs> uh, you have disencumbered yourself to at least 25%. Yes, well, part of the problem is that I'm also now then carrying some of this stuff that I bought, like this sort of a glasses and sauce that I may use for decorations, so, you know, so I definitely will at least leave them here. This actually didn't look pretty, but I'll leave it here for now. Decorative bowl I like. I like those decorative plates well enough, but I don't know where to place them, at least for now. Uh, let's leave that as an option. Candles, I need to go and throw away somewhere. I won't be leaving them here, because they just need to be gotten rid of. As such, well, I guess we could be putting trimmer coins somewhere too a little bit. We have so many of them. So many of them. But yes, a lot better now, <laughs> nonetheless. Tumor coins. I guess we could have a couple of tumor coins right around here, to be honest. Like, just one at a time, thank you. Lovely music. But what do you say, Jim Jim? Should we go and read? What should we do? Do you want to do something else and read? drop just down like into there. That's not what I wanted. At all. Not at all what I wanted. Sure. Eh. It's not quite quite nicely enough looking to my, my opinion from my opinion, but maybe have one a little bit separate like that. Can I have one more on top? I don't know. Would it look good if there was one more on top there? There's a little bit of a rumor coins to need to be around. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, wow, you're so rich, you just scatter rumor coins around. <laughs> you're cool with reading. Good. And well, I even got this here, but after all, I thought that this was the special enemy that we soul trapped. So I thought that it would be making a cute little decoration for our place. He doesn't even have a... Uh, 
he won't be getting into any special weapon or anything. He's just gonna be here for us. And then there's Okrim in this little great soul gym, greater soul gym that we trapped ourselves into it. Oh yeah, I was meaning to also have a look. What does Vampire does actually look? We have killed quite a few vampires after all that might have had dust that would be decent looking unless I used all of it. Maybe I did. Hmm. I don't see any vampire dust here after all. I guess I used it all. It's fine if I did. Yeah, those definitely are not vampire dust. Nope. No vampire dust. And that's not... That's grave dust. That's just grave dust. Nothing more, nothing less. Alrighty. <laughs> that's going straight to the pool room. Mm -hmm. Straight there. Alrighty. Let's start reading the Dance, a dance in Fire books. True. Let's start from chapter 1 and then we'll go through all the way to the chapter 7. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A Dance in Fire, Chapter 1, by Falkin Yard. Scene. The Imperial City, Surondil. Date. 7, Frost Wall. 3rd Era, 397. And yes, going to be a book stream. Well, I gotta read in my new place, you know. My new beautiful home. I wanna be hanging around a little bit, you know. <sighs> It seemed as if the palace had always housed the Atreus Building Commission, the company of clerks and estate agents who outward and notarized nearly every, every construction of any note in the Empire. It had stood for 250 years, since the reign of the Emperor Magnus, a plain-fronted and austere hall on a minor but respectable plaza in the Imperial City. Energetic and ambitious middle-class lads and ladies work there, as well as compl complacent middle-aged ones like Deco Muscotti. No one could imagine a world without the commission, least of all, Scotti. To be accurate, he could not imagine a world without himself in the commission. Lord Atreus is perfectly aware of your contributions, said the managing clerk. Closing the shutter that demar demarcated Scotty's office behind him, but you know that the things have been difficult. Yes, said Scotty stiffly. Lord Fanek's men have been giving us a lot of competition lately, and we must be more efficient if we are to survive. Unfortunately, that means releasing some of our historically best but presently underachieving senior clerks. I understand. Can't be helped. I'm glad that you understand, smiled the managing clerk, smiling thinly and withdrawing. Please, have your room cleared immediately. Scotty began the task of organizing all his work to pass on to his successor. It would probably be, it would probably be young Impralius who would take most of it on, which was its suit which was as it should be, he considered philosophically. The lad knew how to find business. Scotty wondered idly what the fellow would do with the contracts for the new statue of St. Alicia, for which the Temple of the One had applied. Probably invent a clerical error, blame it on his old predecessor, Decumus Scotti, and require an additional cost to rectify. I have correct correspondence for Tecumu Scotti of the Atreus Building Commission. Scotti looked up. A fat-faced courier had entered his office and was trusting for the seal of scroll. He handed the boy a gold piece and opened it up. By the poor penmanship, atrocious spelling and grammar and overall unprofessional tone, it was manifestly evident who the writer was. Leodas Euros, a fellow clerk some years before, who had left the commission after being accused of unethical business practices. Oh, hello, Sotentenho. Welcome to the stream as well. 
and uh, hopefully you have had indeed a good week. And uh, I started to read the the the, the fire in the dance books. Yes. And this is going to be a long time to read in this all true, but we are pretty start after all in this at least at the moment. <laughs> this is going to be challenging. Challenging books, challenging thing to read all the way through. What is so challenging, Jim Jim? Anyways. Dear Scotty, I imagine you always wondered what happened to me and the last place... <laughs> um... <laughs> this is kind of funny, like imagine. Imagine is also written badly with the poor spelling, yes. This patrical section with the poor spelling. That's what I was also thinking. Should I read them like they? I could imagine that they would be really, or should I read them like they, he has written them? That's a good question. I guess I will... Right, just read them as I feel the correct way, but uh, kind of funny. But anyways, dear Scotty, I imagine you always wondered what happened to me, and the last place you would have expected to find me is out in the woods. But that's exactly where I am, haha. <laughs> if you're smart and want to make a lot of extra gold for Lord Atreus and yourself, haha, <laughs> you'll come down to Valinwood too. If you haven't or have been following the politics here lately, you may or may not know that there's been a war between the Bushmere and their neighbors elsewhere over the past two years. Things have only just gone down, calmed down, and there's a lot that needs to be rebuilt. Now I've got more business than I can handle. Yes, you surely do. But I need someone with some clout, someone representing a respected agency. Ah, <sighs> so respected, to get the quill in the ink. That someone is you, my friend. Come and meet me at the Ter Pascos Tavern in Valinesti, Valinwood. I'll be here two weeks and you won't be sorry. <laughs> Zeros. P.S. Bring a wage and a load of timber if you can. What do you have there, Scotty? asked a voice. Scotty startled. It was Impralius, his damnable handsome face speaking through the shutters, smiling in that way that melted the hearts of the stingiest of the patrons and the roughest of stonemasons. Scotty showed the letter in his jacket, po uh, jacket pocket. Personal correspondence, he sniffed. I'll be cleared up here in uh, just a moment. I don't want to hurry you, said Impralius, grabbing a few sheets of blank contracts from Scotty's desk. I've just gone through a stack and the junior scribe's hands are all cramping up, so I thought uh, you wouldn't miss a few. The lad vanished. Scotty retrieved the letter and read it again. Oops. He thought about his life, something he rarely did. It seemed a sea of grey with a black insurmountable wall looming. There was only one narrow passage he could see in that wall. Quickly, before he had a moment to rec reconsider it, he grabbed a dozen of the black contracts with the shimmering gold leaf, Atreus building commissioned by appointment of his imperial majesty and hid them in the satchel with his personal effects. The next day, he began his adventure with a giddy lack of hesitation. He arranged for a seat in a caravan pound for Valenfoot, the single escorted conveyance to the southeast leaving the Imperial City that week. He had scarcely hours to pack, but he remembered to possess a vacant load of timber. It will be extra gold to pay for a horse to pull that, round the convoy head, so I anticipated, some out Scotty with his best impralious grin. Then vacants in all set off that afternoon through the familiar Sirentilic courtyard, country yard site actually, past fields of wildflowers, gently rolling foodlands, friendly hamlets, the clop of the horses whose against the sound stone road reminded Scotty that the Atreus building commission constructed it. 
Five of the 18 necessary contracts for its completion were drafted by his own hand. Very smart of you to bring that wood along, said the grey whiskered brother man next to him on his wagon. You must be in commerce. Of a sort, said Scotty, in a way he hoped was a mysterious before introducing himself. Decum is Scotty. Griff Mullen, said the man, I'm a poet, actually a translator of old postmer literature. I was researching some newly discovered drugs of the Noriad Playmar two years ago when the war broke out and I had to leave. You are no doubt familiar with the Noriad if you are aware of the Green Pact. I'll wait chat for a moment and yes, hello as well, Tanyunta. Welcome to the stream. Sorry if I'm late of uh, actually going and uh, responding. I'm trying to read a little bit more of the book at the time so before I go and read it the chat so it's more complete so to speak. But yes, started to read this through. Uh, Fire in the dance books in Greece in here. But hopefully you have had a good week and everything. Mm. And running a little bit, I was visiting Sass. Yes. <laughs> How's the old fella? How is Sass? Mm. He's doing good too. Well, I hope you guys had fun. Glad to hear doing well too, yes. <laughs> Did a didgeridoo teacher I do a recording at work that's interesting hopefully it was interesting and fun for you too after all shareable question marks <laughs> well I do of course share if there if you wish or if you have actually recorded it so that uh, you can share it I shall continue with the book reading Scotty thought the man might be speaking perfect kipperish but he nodded his head. Naturally, I don't pretend that the Noriad is as renowned as the Meh Aeliadian or as ancient as the Don Circo, but I, but I think it has a remarkable significance to understanding the nature of the Merolithic Bosmere mind. The origin of the wood elf aversion to cutting their own food or eating any plant material at all. Yet, paradoxically, their willingness to import plant stuff from other cultures, I feel, can be linked to a passage in the Noriad. Mullen shuffled through some of his papers, searching for the appropriate text. The Scottish fast to relieve, the carriage soon stopped to camp for the night. They were high on a bluff over a grey stream, and before them was the great valley in Valenwood. Only the cry of seabirds declared the presence of the ocean to the bay to the west. Here the timber was so tall and white, twisting around itself like an impossible knot begun eons ago, to be impenetrable. A few more modest trees, only 50 feet to the lowest branches, stood on the cliff at the edge of the camp. The sight was so alien to Scotty and he found himself so anxious about the proposition of entering the wilderness, that he could not imagine sleeping. Fortunately, Malon had supposed he had found another academic with a passion for the riddles of ancient cultures. Long into the night, he recited Bosmer verses in the original and in his own translation, sobbing and bellowing and whispering wherever appropriate. Gradually, Scotty began to feel drowsy. But the sudden crack of wood snapping made him sit straight up. What was that? Malon smiled. I like it too. Convocation in the malignity of the moonless speculum, a dance of fire. There are some enormous birds up in the trees moving around, whispered Scotty, pointing in the direction of the dark shapes above. I wonder what dark shapes. I wouldn't worry about that, said Malon, irritated with his audience. Now, listen to that, how the poet characterizes Herma Mora's invocation in the 18th stanza of the fourth book. The dark shapes in the trees were some of them perched like birds, 
others littered like snakes, and still others stood up straight like men. As Smallon recited his verse, Scotty watched the figures softly leap from branch to branch, half gliding across impossible distances for anything without wings. They gathered in groups and then re reorganized until they had spread to every tree around the camp. Suddenly, they plummeted from the heights. Mara! cried Scotty. They're falling like rain! Uh, probably seedbots, Malan shrugged, not turning around. Some of the trees have remarkable. The camp erupted in chaos. In the total chaos. Mm. You do have free access to it, obviously, but it was quite a short bit. Alrighty. Yeah, it would be interesting to hear you play the didgeridoo later on, I'm sure. Studio mic for recording, then I might get something worth sharing. Alrighty, Tayunta. But, uh, alrighty. The camp erupted into chaos. Fire spurs out into the vacants. Wagons. The horses wailed from mortal, mortal blows. Casks of wine, fresh water and liquor cushed their contents to the ground. A nimble shadow dashed past Scotty and Malon, gathering sacks of grain and gold with impossible agility and grace. Scotty had only one glance at it, lit up by a sudden nearby burst of flame. It was a sleek creature with pointed ears. White yellow eyes, mottled pied fur, fur, and a tail like a whip. Werewolf, he whispered, shrinking back. A werewolf. Catai rot, groaned Malon. Much worse. Gajidic cousins or some such thing come to plunder. Are you sure? As quickly as they struck, the creatures retreated. Diving off the bluff before the battle mage and knight, the caravan's escorts had fully opened their eyes. Malon and Scotty ran to the precipice and saw a hundred feet below the tiny figures dash out of the water, shake themselves and disappear into the wood. Werewolves aren't acrobats like that, said Malon. They were Definitely got her out. Bastard thieves. Thanks, then Dart, they didn't realize the value of my notebooks. Oh, it wasn't a complete loss. So when's the first book? They were ambushed. He was fired from his job because he was getting too old, basically. He tried to go and uh, start a new life building it up in a different place, and then on the way to that new place, getting ambushed. Phew, luckily the books were at heart. <laughs> yes, indeed, the books were all left alone. The notes were not precious for them, as it was for Melon, quite clearly. So, a dance in the fire, chapter 2. By Falkin Yard. It was a complete loss. The Gathe Rat had stolen or destroyed almost every item of value in the caravan in just a few minutes. Time. <laughs> like completely forgetting to say and read the time. In just a few minutes time. Dekumus got this wagon load of wood he had hoped to trade with the boss mare, had been set on fire and then toppled off the bluff. His clothing and contracts were tattered and crowned into the mud of dirt mixed with split wine. All the pilgrims, merchants, and adventurers in the group moaned and wept as they gathered the remnants of their belongings by the rising sun of the dawn. I best not tell anyone that I managed to hold on to my nose for my translation of the Mororiat play bar, whispered the poet Griff Malone. They'd probably turn on me. Scotty politely declined the opportunity, the opportunity of telling Malon just how little value he himself placed on the man's property. Instead, he counted the coins in his purse. 34 gold pieces. 
very little indeed for an entrepreneur beginning a new business. Hoi! came a cry from the wood. A small party of Bosmer emerged from a ticket, clad in letter mail and bearing arms. Friend or foe? Neither, crawled the, gon crawled the convoy ahead. Crawled the convoy ahead. You must be the Zuron Deals, laughed the leader of the group, a tall skeleton teen youth with a sharp vulpine face. We heard you were en route. Evidently so did our enemies. I thought the war was over, muttered one of the caravans now ruined merchants. The boss mayor laughed again. No act of war. Just a little border enterprise. You are going on into the Falinesti? I'm not. The convoy had shook his head. As far as I'm concerned, my duty is done. No more horses. No more caravans. Just a fat profit loss to me. The men and women crowded around the man, protesting, threatening, begging. But he refused to step foot in Phelanwood. If there were the new times of peace, he said, he'd rather come back for the next war. Scotty tried a different route and approached the boss mare. He spoke with an alternative but friendly voice, the kind he used in negotiations with Peavis Carpenters. I don't suppose you'd consider escorting me to Falinesi. I'm a representative for an important imperial agency, the Atrius Building Commission, here to help repair and alleviate some of the problems the war with the Kashid brought to your province. Patriotism... 20 gold pieces, and you must carry your own gear if you have any left, replied the boss mayor. Scotty reflected that negotiations with Peavis Carpenters rarely went this way either. Oh dear. Six eager people had enough gold on them for payment. Among those without enough funds was the poet, who appealed to Scotty for assistance. I'm sorry, Kruf. I only have 14 gold left over. Not even enough for a decent room when I get to Valenesti. I really would help you if I could, said Scotty, persuading himself that it was true. Would it be the truth? The band of six and their boss Mirascoch began the descent down a rocky path along the bluff. Within an hour's time, they were deep in the jungles of Valenwood, a never-ending canopy of hues of browns and greens, Obscured the sky, a millennial's word of wallen leaves formed a deep, warm sea of putrefaction beneath their feet. Several miles were crossed wading through the slime. For several more, they took a labyrinthian path across wallen branches and the low-hanging pods of giant trees. Yeah, Catchies didn't understand the value though, what was valuable in the books and the notes. And uh, neither did our poor little Scotty after all. He just left him there now because he didn't have enough gold. Didn't even give those 14 gold pieces after all. So, yay. All the while, hour after hour, the inexhaustible Bosmer host moved so fast the Surantil struggled to keep from being left behind. A red-faced little merchant with short legs took a bad step on a rotten branch and nearly fell. His fellow provincials had to help him up. The Bosmere paused only a moment, the eyes continually dart into the shadows in the trees above before moving on at their usual expedition space. What are they so nervous about? With the merchant irritably, irritably. More catarat? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous, laughed the boss mayor unconvincingly. Catarat uh, is far into Valenwood. In times of peace, <laughs> they should never dare. When the crew passed high enough above the swamp that the smell was somewhat dissipated, Scotty felt a sudden pang of hunger. He was used to four meals a day in Surantilic custom. Hours of non-stop exertion without food was not part of his regimen as a comfortably paid clerk. He pondered, feeling somewhat delirious, how long they had been trotting through the jungle. Twelve hours? Twenty? 
a week. Time was meaningless. Sunlight was only sporadic through the vegetative ceiling. Pros uh, prosporescent mold on the trees and in the muck below provided the only regular illumination. Hmm. Is it at all possible for us to rest and eat? He hollered to his host up ahead. We are near to Fallenus, they gave the echo in reply. Lots of food there. The path continued upward for several hours more across a clot of fallen logs, rising up to the first and then the second boards of the tree line. As they rounded the long corner, the travelers found themselves midway up a waterfall that fell a hundred feet or more. No one had the energy to complain as they began pulling up the stacks of rock, agonizing foot by foot. The Bosmer escorts disappeared into the mist, but Scotty kept climbing until there was no more rock left. He wiped the sweat and river water from his eyes. Falinest spread across the horizon before him. Sprawling across both banks of the river stood the mighty Krat Oak city, with groves and orchards of lesser trees crowding it like supplicants before their king. At the lesser scale, the tree that formed the moving city would have been extraordinary, narked and twisted with a gorgeous crown of gold and green, dripping with wines and shining with the sap. At the mile tall and half as wide, it was the most magnificent thing Scotty had ever seen. If he had not been a starry man with the soul of a clerk, he would have sung. But he had the soul of a clerk, so he didn't sing. There you are, said the leader of the escorts. Not too far a walk. You should be glad it's winter tight. In summer tide, the city is on the far south end of the province. Scotty was lost as to how to proceed. The side of the vertical metropolis where people moved about like ants disorientated all his sensibilities. You wouldn't know of an inn called... He paused for a moment and then pulled Churis's letter from his pocket. Uh, something like Mother Pasco's Tavern. Mother Pascots, the late Bosmer laughed his familiar contemptuous laugh. You won't want to stay there. Visitors always prefer the Asia Hall in the top ports. It's expensive, but very nice. I'm meeting someone at Mother Pascots Tavern. Uh, if you've made up your mind to go, take a lift to Havel Slump and ask for directions there. Just don't get lost and fall asleep in the Western Cross. Hmm. Interesting city. This apparently struck the youth's friends as a very witty chest, and so it was with their laughter echoing behind him that Scotty crossed the writing root system to the base of Palinesti. The ground was littered with leaves and refuse, and from moment to moment a class or a bone would plummet from far above, so he walked with his neck crook to have warning, to have warning, yes. An intricate network of platforms anchored to thick wine slip up and down the slick trunk of a city with perfect grace, manned by operators with arms as thick as an ox's belly. Scotty approaches the nearest fellow at one of the platforms, who was idly smoking from a class pipe. I was wondering if you might take me to Havel Slump. The mer nodded, and within a few minutes' time, Scotty was 200 feet in the air at the crook between two mighty branches. Curled webs of moss stretched unevenly across the fork, forming a share in the roof for several dozen small buildings. There were only a few stones in the alley, but around the bend ahead, he could hear the sound of music and people. Scotty tipped the Falinesi platform ferryman a gold piece and asked for the location of Mother Pascot's tavern. Straight, of e straight ahead of you, sir, but you won't find anyone there, the ferryman explained, pointing in the direction of the noise. Morn does everyone in Havel Slump has a revelry. 
Scotty walked carefully along the narrow street. Though the crowd felt as solid as the marble avenues of the Imperial City, there were slick cracks in the park that exposed fatal drops into the river. He took a moment to sit down, to rest and get used to the view from the heights. It was a beautiful day for certain, but it took Scotty only a few minutes of contemplation to rise up in alarm. A jolly little raft anchored downstream below him had distinctly moved several inches while he watched it. But it hadn't moved at all. He had. Together with everything around him, it was no metaphor. The city of Palinesti walked. And, considering its size, it moved quickly. Scotty rose to his feet and into a cloud of smoke that drifted out from around the bend. It was the most delicious roast he had ever smelled. The clerk forgot his fear and ran. The reverie, as the ferryman had termed it, took place on an enormous platform tied to the tree, wide enough to be a plaza in any other city. A fantastic assortment of the most amazing people Scotty had ever seen were jammed shoulder to shoulder together. Many eating, many more drinking, and some dancing to a mutist and singing perch of an offshoot above the crowd. They were largely bosmer, true natives clad in colorful leather and bones, with a close minority of orcs. Whirling through the throng, dancing and bellowing at one another, were a hideous ape people. A few heads bobbling over the tops of the crowd belonged not, as Scotty first assumed, to very tall people, but to a family of centaurs. Care for some mutton? queried the wizened old mare, who roasted an enormous beast on some red hot rocks. Scotty quickly paid him a gold piece and devoured the leg he was given, and then another gold piece and another leg. The fellow chuckled when Scotty began choking on a piece of crystal and handed him a muck of a rotting white drink. He drank it and felt a quiver run through his body as he were being tickled. What is that? Scotty asked. Yucca. Fermented, fermented pig's milk. I can let you have a flagon of it and a bit more mutton for another gold. Scotty agreed. Bait gobbled down the meat and took the flagon with him as he slipped into the crowd. His co-worker, Leodes Euros, the man who had told him to come to Valen Wood, was nowhere to be seen. When the flagon was a quarter empty, Scotty stopped looking for Euros. When it was half empty, he was dancing with the group, oblivious to the broken planks and caps in the friend's fence work. At three quarters empty, he was trading jokes with the group of centaurs whose language was completely alien to him. By the time the Vlaken was completely trained, he was asleep, snoring, while the revelry continued on all around his supine party. The next morning, still asleep, Scotty had the sensation of someone kissing him. He made it a face to return the favor, but a pain like fire spread through his chest and forced him to open his eyes. There was an insect the size of a large calf sitting on him, crushing him, its spiky legs holding him down while a central spiral plated vortex of a mouth tore through his skirt shirt even. He screamed and trashed, but the beast was too strong. It, would found his, uh, it had found its meal and it was going to finish it. It's over, thought Scotty wildly. I should have never left home. I could have stayed in the city and perhaps found work with Lord Fanek. I, I could have begun again as a junior clerk and worked my way back up. Suddenly, the mouth released itself. The creature shivered once, expelled a purse of yellow pile, and died. I got one, cried a voice not too distantly. For a moment, Scotty lay still. His head dropped and his chest burned. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw movement. 
another of the horrible monsters was scurried to watch him. He scrambled, trying to push himself free, but before he could come out, there was the sound of a bow cracking and an arrow pierced the second insect. Hello, hello, 472, and welcome to the stream as well. I'm uh, reading a long story of the uh, Dance of Fire chapter books. But uh, welcome, and I hope you have had a good week and everything. Mm. Is this the city in Outer Elder Scrolls game? Do you know? I don't think so either. Hmm. It was originally an arena. This seems like a city that I would love to see, though. I would love to see this city. They should make a Morrowind or the Elder Scrolls game where this city would actually be shown. Because this seems like a very sweet city. Way more than Oblivion cities, for sure. I would have to say. <laughs> this seems so much more interesting. I wanna go into this city. <laughs> oh, and welcome back, Tayuta, as well. Um, but yeah, it's going okay. And yes, hello also, Scraplord. Sorry that I'm so late in uh, reading everything. <laughs> but uh, hello and welcome to you as well. What's going on in this book? Well, uh, Scotty who is our main character. We already read one of the books after all. Uh, Scotty was a clerk in the Imperial City until he got fired because he was getting basically too old and another juvenile member was getting coming and taking the job. Well, after that, he also got a letter from one of his older colleagues that was fired, that wrote very terribly, and invited him to visit the Postmer city, where the Kashids and the Postmer were having a war, though it was supposed to be uh, sort of a peaceful now, for now, sort of, was supposed to be. But uh, he got that invite and it asked him to also bring some wood, because they don't use their own wood here in the postmare, but they do like to build stuff from other people's wood, so they like to import it. Well, so he did, and he set out to a new life into the postmare forest, into the middle of the forest. And uh, he was traveling there when the Kashids came, and uh, or some type of Kashid creatures came and ambushed them, ambushed the caravan, burned all of his food, he had hide very little gold left, and uh, but uh, and most of the caravan was completely just like the caravan leader, nope, I'm not gonna even go further, he got an escort from some postmere that happened to come around, but uh, he did have to pay quite a bit for it too. And then they traveled quite a bit to be able to travel to the postmere city, that is actually a city that is moving, a tree-like city that is able to move, which is a very interesting concept as a city, Vale and Wood indeed. And um, it's very interesting from what I read here at least already, seems like a very beautiful place too. He tried to go and meet the one... Uh, um, he tried to go meet the associate that he was supposed to meet, but didn't find him, but in the place uh, that he was going in then, uh, the tavern, he did get into uh, eating and uh, drinking some, uh, I don't remember what sort of milk it was, or, or sour milk or some sauce, or fermented, yeah, it was fermented milk, nonetheless. Uh, he drank that, he got really drunk. 100% drunk, he fell asleep, and this is where he then woke up. He woke up with the fact that an insect was trying to eat him, basically some sort of a very strange insect was trying to eat him, and uh, the, someone did shoot it with an arrow, and uh, now he was trying to scramble away from another one that he was able to see. And we didn't get further yet with this book. And this is the second chapter of this seven series book. Book series of seven books. Um, domestic disturbances. <laughs> what else? Fighting Kashid. Ah, you had to go break up a fight. 
to put simply. Alrighty. Sounds sad. Sounds like a sad thing, Dayunta. I hope it was okay, nonetheless. Uh, maybe they added in this online. I don't know. Valenwood is pretty requested place for the next Elder Scrolls. Yeah, I do understand that this will be a lot more difficult to do and build because it's very well presented, but it definitely seems like a lot more interesting location overall. And um, I don't know, of course, like something like the Imperial City, Oblivion areas, I think they are a lot simpler to do. Well, that is, with the idea. But this area seems way more interesting. This game I would want to play just for the fact that it would actually be in an interesting location. <sighs> Better than just snow and highlights like Skyrim, yes. Unfortunately, Skyrim also isn't quite that interesting of a location. That's okay, it's better than Oblivion's <laughs> uh, world in my opinion, but... Or the world, there's a uh, main city and all. Moving three cities are probably hard to program, yeah. I'm quite sure that that would be hard to program to pick it for sure, and then... To make them beautiful and everything, and how would you know where they are? You would have to be seeing that they... What if you would be trying to go into the city and the city would be moving away from you? At the same time. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know how it should work then. <laughs> but uh, anyways, this sounds like a very interesting location. But uh, I guess we shall continue with the story. But a little bit of a recap nonetheless for those who joined just a moment ago on what is the Scotty story. Get the first one again. I just saw it move a little this time. Okay, that's what happened. Uh, the cargoes that he was trying to move under got shot then too. So first the uh, first insect that was trying to eat him with the spike leg and crushing him and everything was uh, got shot. For a moment, Scotty lay still. His head dropped and his chest burned. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw movement. Another of the horrible monsters was scurried towards him. He scrambled, trying to push himself free, but before he could come out, there was a sound of a bow cracking and an arrow pierced the second insect. Good shot, cried another voice. Get the first one again, I just saw it move a little. This time, Scotty felt the impact of the bolt hit the carcass. He cried out, but he could hear how muffled his voice was, was by the beetle's body. Cautiously, he tried sliding a foot out and rolling under, but the movement apparently had the effect of convincing the archers that the creature still lived. A volley, a volley of arrows was launched forward. Now the beast was sufficiently perforated, so pools of its blood, and likely the blood of its victim, began to seep on onto Scotty's body. <sighs> Maybe you should have just been still for a moment so that they wouldn't have thought that it was alive <laughs> might have been better when they apparently in no way are able to see Spotty or anything so mm. you feel like it wouldn't be it's a big city it'll just be a separate zone that happened to have a entries exits that move around the map mm. may have may have Jim Jim but I don't know how they would want to be doing it anyway so it's a good question Anyways, as I said, also, holy Scrap Lord and uh, 472 had a good week and everything. Hopefully so. So, when Scotty was a lad, before he grew too sophisticated for such sports, he had often gone to the Imperial Arena for the competitions of war. He recalled a great veteran of the fights when asked, telling him his secrets. Whenever I'm in doubt of what to do and I have a shield, I stay behind it. Scotty followed that advice. After an hour, when he no longer heard arrows being fired, he threw aside the remains of the buck and leapt as quickly as he could to a stand. It was not a moment too soon. A gang of eight archers had their bows pointed in his direction, ready to fire. When they saw him, they laughed. Did anyone ever tell you not to slip into the Western Cross? 
how are we going to exterminate all the horrors if you try and keep feeding them? So, uh, in the Western Cross, apparently there's quite a bit some insect-like creatures like horrors, and uh, who like eating the tree trunk people, so... Yeah. Ah, I'm sorry, Tayunta, that that's getting in the way of your Friday routine, for sure. And yeah, sounds serious. I hope it gets solved. Is it like some neighbor of yours, or is it the people that you live with, or... Anyways, I hope it's gonna be stopped soon then, that fight, so that uh, you can just... Relax for the Friday evening for sure. I hope. I hope so. Scotty shook his head and walked back along the platform, round the bend to Havel Slump. He was bloodied and torn, and tired, and he had far too much fermented pig's milk. So yeah, fermented pig milk. All he wanted was a proper place to lie down. He stepped into Mother Pascot's tavern, a dank place, wet with sap, smelling of mild, mild dew, mildew, I don't know. My name is Decumus Scotty, he said. I was hoping you have someone named Euro staying here. Hmm, Decumus Scotty, pondered the uh, blessy proprietis, proprietis. Well, Mother Pascot herself. I've heard that name. Oh, you must be the fellow he left a note for. Uh, let me go see if I can find it. So there was at least a note for Dekumus Gotti left by the other guy. Hmm. It's kind of unpredictable at the moment, so I can't properly relax. Yeah, I can understand that. Hot weather making people rowdy. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to hit anybody, but heavens forbid if you get in the middle of me and my Friday show out time. Uh, yeah, for sure. It's quite serious stuff. Uh, yeah. You're on shield right quick. <laughs> yeah. We'll continue this in a moment. I'm just gonna show off to the others who joined. Uh, I made some extra decorations while I was... Uh, while I uh, looked around myself, I went and bought some candles, bought this book so that we can actually read them here at our home. They're gonna be here. I came at dinner, a little bit better looking table here with candle beer, pewter and everything. A little bit more light to begin with. Indeed, the loot that I wanted to buy, I wanted to place the Mehrun's razor here, some razor plumes here. Uh, the razors that... Um, the, 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 Cliffhangers and all who've been chasing out everywhere. I thought that that's actually pretty nice plumes that they have So I placed that there some tumor coins on here Some more candles around the place Okay, Annie Merki mm. Well, I hope that will be going well Anyways, and also here I added just a couple of candles and then there's the tumor schematics and one extra book here. So I moved this a little bit more into the left so that I would be able to fit at least something here. So, few changes. And uh, in the start of the stream also placed candle of emeralds over here into both sides. So there's a little bit more light in the place. Just a teeny tiny bit more light. Would be liking to have something here too. But at least a couple of core mics right here too that we were talking about previously in the nice decorative bowl and everything. I do like this setting a lot more than it was before. And a game at dinner is a perfect book in my opinion here, so <laughs> I'll go to get something while I do tour. Yeah, and it's not like it's gonna take a while that long, but just a quick little tour to others who joined a little bit later. And of course class is there. But anyways, hope you guys enjoy well enough our setting at the moment. And I hope it's okay that I did some decorating on my own. I thought that it's it should be pretty okay for me to do some of it. It's uh, just decorating after all. 
So, a dance in fire, chapter 3 then on the other hand. Quite a few more books to go though, through this. Let's see. Another letter from this Euro Sky. By Fourteen Yard. Mother Bascots disappeared into the sordid hole that was her tavern, and emerged a moment later with a scrap of paper with Leodas Euro's familiar scrawl. Deco Muscotti held it up before a patch of sunlight that had found its way through the massive boards of the tree city, and read, Scotty, so you made it to Valinesti Valinwood. Congratulations, sus. Even I could write better than this guy can, which is quite an achievement. Hmm. I'm sure you had quite an adventure getting here. Unfortunately... I'm not here anymore, as you probably guess. Uh, there's a town down river called Atje Imit. Imat. Get the pot and join me. It's ideal. I hope you brought a lot of contracts, cause these people need a lot of buildings done. They were close to the war, you see, but not so close they don't have any money. Money left to pay. Haha. <laughs> Meet me down. Meet. Me down here as soon as you can, son. Ah. Can you buy more furniture for your house in Morrowind? I don't remember. I don't think you can buy more exactly furniture, unfortunately. I don't think so, at least. But at least some decorations, nonetheless. Well, I did buy the loot, but like other furniture. Hmm. So, Scotty pondered, Juros had left Falinesti and gone to some place called Atia. Given his poor penmanship and castly spelling, it could equally well be Ati, Api, Ortri, Imtri, Urta, or Krakamaka. The sensible thing to do, Scotty knew, was to call this adventure over and try to find some way to get back home to the Imperial City. He was no mercenary devoted to a life of thrills. He was, or at least had been, a senior clerk at a successful private building commission. Over the last few weeks, he had been robbed by the catty rat, taken on a dead march through the jungle by a gang of giggling Bosmeri, half starved to death, drugged with fermented pig's milk, nearly slain by some kind of giant tick, and attacked by archers. He was filthy, exhausted, and had, he counted, ten gold pieces to his name. Now, the man whose proposal poured him to the depths of misery was not even there. It was both judicious and seemly to abandon the enterprise entirely. And yet, a small but distinct voice in his head told him, You have been chosen. You have no other choice but to see this true. Scotty turned to the stout old woman, Mother Pascot, who has, uh, who had been watching him curiously. I was wondering if you knew of a village that was at the edge of the recent conflict with Elsevier. It's called something like Athe. You must mean Athe, Sigrid. My middle lad, Vigil, he manages a dairy down there. Beautiful country right on the river. Is that where your friend went? Yes, said Scotty. Do you know the fastest way to get there? After a short conversation, an even shorter ride to Polynesti's route, routes by the way of the platforms and a jog to the river bank, Scotty was negotiating transport with a huge fair-haired, Bosmer with the face like a pickled garb. He called himself Captain Palfix, but even Scotty with his sheltered life could recognize him for what he was. A retired pirate for hire, a smuggler for certain, and probably much worse. His ship, which had clearly been stolen in the distant past, was a bent old Imperial sloop. With the gold and a will being at hay in two days' time, Boomed Captain Palfix expansively. I have done. No, sorry. Nine gold pieces. 
replied Scotty, and feeling that need for explanation added, I had turned, but I gave one to the platform fireman to get me down here. Nine, it's just as fine, said the captain agreeably. Truth be told, I was going to add a whether you paid me or not. Make yourself comfortable on the boat. I'll be leaving in just a few minutes. The Agumus Scott boarded the whistle, which sat low in the water of the river, stacked high with crates and sacks that spilled out of the hold and galley onto the deck. Each was smart with stumps advertising the most in Nocuous substances, copper, scraps, lard, ink, high rock meal marked for cattle, tar, fish, jelly, Ooh, and some good tar, eh? Scotty's imaginations reeled picturing what sort of illicit imports were truly aboard. It took more than those few minutes for Captain Palvix to haul in the rest of his cargo, but in an hour, the anchor was up and they were sailing down river towards Athey. The green grey water barely rippled, only touched by the fingers of the breeze. Lust plant life crowded the banks, obscuring from sight all the animals that sang and roared at one another. Lulled by the Syrian surroundings, Scotty drifted to sleep. At night, he awoke and gratefully accepted some clean clothes and food from Captain Palfi. Why are you going to Athey, if I may ask? queried the Bosmer. I'm meeting a former colleague there. He asked me to come down from an imperial city where I worked for the Atreus Building Commission to negotiate some contracts. Scotty took another bite of the tried sausages they were sharing for dinner. Where going to try to repair and reverberate whatever bridges, roads and other structures that got damaged in the recent war with the Kashit. It's been a hard two years, the captain nodded his head, but I suppose good for me and the likes of you and your friend. Trade routes got off, now they think there's going to be war with the Somerset Isles, you heard that? Scotty shook his head. I've done my share of smuggling skooma down the ghost, even helping some revolutionary types escape the mains of Rad. Uh, but now that the wars have been a legitimate traitor, wars have made me a legitimate traitor, a businessman. The first casualties of war is always the corrupted. Well, we learned something new. The first casualties of war are always the ones that are corrupted. And yes, welcome back to Chim Chim before. <laughs> he can't abandon the Enterprise yet, there's like five more books, yes, very much. And yes, delicious, delicious tar was mentioned there as uh, one of the things that was uh, taken down. And thanks for sharing the channel with Sinek and welcome to the stream. <laughs> All is well here, validated by a fictional book in a fictional universe, I'll have to take your word for it. <laughs> Alrighty, but hello and welcome to stream, and uh, I hope you had fun streaming before me, and uh, on the other hand, hopefully you had a good week too. Hopefully everything good, and uh, we're just reading the law book series, <laughs> where, if I do very quick recap, not as long as I did before, we are Scotty, who used to be working in the Atreus Building Commission to negotiate some contracts and so on and forth. And, um, but we got fired, younger guy came up, we got a letter that it was one that kind of wanted us to go work in a war zone between the Kashiti and Bosmer, there was a war, we went into a living city, we were ambushed on the way, we lost most of our supplies and uh, gold and everything, we paid the last bits of gold to this guy now that we are traveling to another city near that Bosmer city, <laughs> because that guy wasn't even in the Bosmer city anymore, the Bosmer city is by the way a pretty sweet looking place from the descriptions, it is a living tree after all that moves, that would be a sweet place for uh, um, Elder Scrolls games, for sure. Hope that they will make one into Valen Boots. And uh, yeah, now I'm traveling with the guy that used to be more corrupted, used to do way more uh, skooma smuggling and everything, and uh, he was the one of the first casualties of the war, after all. Not able to do 
anymore or be corrupted because there's other business too. So there's that very short little description of what or everything has been happening. But yes, we'll see if we actually meet the guy that originally wrote us a letter uh, at Scotty. But yes, hopefully everyone is also doing well. Okay, Scotty said he was sorry to hear that. And they lapsed into silence, watching the stars and moon's reflection on the still water. The next day, Scotty awoke to find the captain wrapped up in his sail, torpid from alcohol, singing in a low, slurred voice. When he saw Scotty rise, he offered his flacon of jacca. I learned my lesson during revelry at the Western Cross. <laughs> the captain laughed. And the person into tears, I don't want to be legitimate. All the pirates I used to know are still raping and stealing and smuggling and selling nice folk like you into slavery. I swear to you, I never thought the first time that I ran a real shipment of legal goods that my life would turn out like this. Oh, I know I could go back to it. But Bondar knows not after all I've seen. I'm a ruined man. Sad, sad story. He can't be smuggling and doing all horrible things anymore and be a proper pirate. Oh dear, poor fellow, ain't he? Poor, poor fellow. Scotty helped the weeping mare out of the sail, murmuring words of reassurance. Then he added, forgive me for changing the subject, but where are we? Oh, moaned Captain Palfix miserably. We made good time. Ate's right around the bend in the river. Then it looks like Ate's on fire, said Scotty, pointing. Oh, yes, poor ex-pirate. Um, and also looks like the place that we were trying to go into is already on fire again. Lovely. Seems like we have a good luck with this uh, journey of ours, after all. A great plume of smoke, black as pitch, was rising above the trees. As they drifted around the bend, then they next saw the flames, and then the blackened skeletal remains of the village dying. Blazing villagers left from the rocks into the river. A cacophony of wailing met their ears, and they could see, roaming along the edges of the town, the figures of Kashiti soldiers bearing torches. Panda, bless me, slurred the captain. The war's back on. Oh no, whimpered Scotty. The war has never ended, truly. The sloop drifted with the current towards the opposite shore, away from the fiery town. Scotty turned his attention here, and the sanctuary it offered. Just a peaceful harbour. Away from the horror, there was a shutter of leaves in two of the trees, and a dozen light cashier dropped to the ground, armed with bows. They see us, hissed Scotty, and they could call bows. Well, of course they have bows, snarled Captain Polvix. We possibly may have invented the bloody things, but we didn't think to keep them secret, you bloody bureaucrat. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody parakrat. Now they're setting the arrows on fire. Yes, they do that sometimes. Captain, they're shooting at us. They're shooting at us with flaming arrows. Uh, so they are, the captain agreed. The aim here is to avoid being hit, you see. Aim is not getting hit, Scotty. And you just saying the obvious isn't helping the matters, is it? Yes, they do that sometimes. <laughs> yes, very much so. But hit they were. And very shortly thereafter. Even worse, the second volley of arrows hit the supply of a bitch. Supply of bitch, which ignited in a tremendous blue blaze. Scotty crapped Captain Porfix and they left overboard just before the ship and all its cargo disintegrated. Doesn't seem like Captain Polfix is going to be doing very well after this either, to be honest. I kind of like the fellow. Poor pirate. And now even more of a pirate. Yes, supply of a bitch. Yes. 
Very much so. The shock of the cold water brought the Bosmer into temporary superiority. He called Scotty, who was already swimming as fast as he could towards the bend. Master Decamus, where do you think you're swimming to? Back to Volinesti, cried Scotty. It will take you days, and by the time you get there, everyone will know about the attack of An on Ate. They'll never let anyone they don't know in. The closest to us down river is Krenos. Maybe they'll give us shelter. Scotty swam back to the captain and side by side. They began paddling in the middle of the river, past the burning residue of the village. He thanked Mara that he had learned to swim. Many, as Surantil did not, as largely landlocked as the imperial province was. Had he been raised in mere corrupt or Artimon, he might have been doomed. But the imperial city itself was encircled by water, and every lad and lass there knew how to cross without a boat. Even those who grew up to be clerks and not adventurers. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Tayunta. No worries about the language. Ei tarvitse murehtia siitä. I'm sorry. I hope the situation is now solved. Finally. Maybe. Hopefully. And yeah, it doesn't sound good. <laughs> Use one of the Finnish swear words I know twice. Yes, that was uh, twice. If I would be using uh, that specific type of a curse word, I would be basically saying Vittu ja kevät, itse, personally. That's my preference in that, but anyways. <laughs> uh, not that I like to use them too much. It culminated pretty bad. Should be good now, but you never know. I hope it will be fine now then. Anyway, what did I miss? Quite a lot of stuff with the books, for sure. Unfortunately, Tayunda. But, uh, yeah. I hope... I hope it's at least going to be now okay, but I'm sorry to hear that there was that sort of a trouble for you. you no, know, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense that there's the, uh, like, a spring of it, but, <laughs> you know, it doesn't make sense, but so it is nonetheless. Yep. Curses. Curses after curses. That's what my mother uses sometimes, mm. <laughs> Yep, yep. I don't know why it's like that, but so it is. Spring for it. Perkele, perkele. That doesn't work exactly the same way. For some war reason, to, uh, basically, it is cunt, after all. Vittu is cunt. So, it's basically uh, the, the spring of cunts. Which doesn't make any sense, but so it is, for some reason it finished, so yeah. It's probably going worse for our mate Scotty here, yeah. So wherever we went, Tayunda left. We were traveling into the city, I think. Did we arrive into the city, the living city that was moving around? Maybe. But anyways, we almost got eaten by insects there. We did see the beautiful city, yes. But then we went to the tavern uh, where we were supposed to meet the guy. And um, there was just a letter to say that, hey, uh, let's meet up actually in one of these cities next to the, uh, this big place. So that would be a better location to be starting to do business. And uh, well, we used our last bits of gold to try to be traveling there. And uh, the boat that we were on was, first of all, pirate boat, basically. Poor Captain Paul Fix is a guy who used to be a pirate. And well, now he had to stop that sort of business because he is actually... Yeah. Going into legitimate business and all. But uh, then the city that we were arriving at and tried to get into was actually in fire because the war had begun again and the Kashid were burning the place right at that very moment and they also shot flaming arrows at the boat, the ship, with our drunken captain and everything. Uh, well, it kind of didn't go very well, did it? And uh, the ship and all the cargo burned and we are swimming 
swimming to the next closest city with our lovely little captain Polfix friend who used to be a captain and now doesn't even have a ship. So, uh, yeah, that's where we are at the story. <laughs> so, uh, quite a bit nonetheless. <sighs> okay. Captain Polfix so pretty faded as he grew used to the water's temperature. Even in winter tide, the Xyla River was fairly temperate and after a fashion, even comfortable. The Bosmer strokes were uneven and he'd stray closer to Scotty and ten feet away, pushing ahead and then falling behind. Scotty looked to the shore to his right. The flames had caught the trees like tinder. Behind them was an inferno, with which they were barely keeping pace. To the shore on their left, all looked fair, until he saw a tremble in the river reeds and then what caused it. A fright of the largest cats he had ever seen. They were auburn-haired, green-eyed beasts with jaws and teeth to match his wildest nightmares. And they were watching the two swimmers and keeping pace. Captain Paul Fix, we can't go to either that shore or the other one, or we'll be barboiled or eaten, Scotty whispered. Try to even your kicking and your strokes. Breathe like you would normally. If you're feeling tired, tell me and we'll float on our backs for a while. Anyone who has had the experience of giving rational advice to the trunkard would understand the hopelessness. <sighs> Scotty kept pace with the captain, slowing himself. Quickening, drifting left and right, while the bosomer moaned all the tears from his pirate days. Poor old little <sighs> captain. When he wasn't watching his companion, he watched the cats on the shore. After a stretch, he turned to his right. Another village had caught fire. Undoubtedly, it was Krenos. Scotty stared at the place in fury, awed by the sight of the destruction, and did not hear that the captain had ceased to sing. Ah, oh, had ceased to sing. When he turned back, Captain Polvix was gone. Oh no, I thought that we would be able to have Captain Polvix as our good little friend and everything, but no, that is not the case. <sighs> Sadly, not the case at all in the end. <sighs> I will miss the bugger. Anyways. Scotty dove into the murky depths of the river over and over again. There was nothing to be done. When he surfaced after his final search, he saw that the giant cats had moved on, perhaps assuming that he too had drowned. He continued his lonely swim down river. A tributary, a tributary, he noted, had formed a final barrier, keeping the flames from spreading further. But there were no more towns. After several hours, he began to ponder the wisdom of going ashore. Which shore was the question? Which shore would you go? The one that had the flames but didn't at least continue forward, or the one that had the cat beasts. Hmm. Which one would you choose? He was spared the decision, though. Ahead of him was a rocky island with a bonfire. He did not know if he were intruding on a party of Bosmeri or Kashiti, only that he could swim no more. With straining, aching muscles, he pulled himself onto the rocks. They were Posmer refugees, he cattered, even before they told him. Roasting over the fire was the remains of one of the giant cats that had been stalking him through the jungle on the opposite shore. Shenshe Taika, said one of the young warriors ravenously, It's no animal. It's as smart as a catarat or ohmes or any other bleeding kashiti. Did this one drowned. It would have gladly killed it. I would have gladly killed it. You like the meat, though, sweet from all the sugar this ass is it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'll rather drown. Alrighty, Scrap Lord. <laughs> uh, Scotty did not know if he was capable of eating a creature as intelligent as a man, 
or mirror, but he surprised himself as he had done several times over the last days. It was rich, succulent, and sweet like succored pork, but no seasonings had been added. He surveyed the crowd as he ate. A sad lot, some still weeping for lost family members. They were the survivors of both the villages of Krenos and Ate, and war was on every person's lips. Why had the Kashiti attacked again? Why specifically directed at Scotty? As a certain deal? Why was the Emperor not enforcing peace in his provinces? I was to meet another certain deal, he said to a Bosmer maiden who he understood to be from Ate. His name was Leodas Euros. I don't suppose you know what might have happened to him. I don't know your friend, but there were many certain tales in Ate when the fire came, said the girl. Some of them, I think, left quickly. They were going to Vindisi, inland, in the jungle. I'm going there tomorrow, so are many of us. If you wish, you may come as well. Degmus got in order solemnly. He made himself as comfortable as he could in the stony ground of the river island, and somehow, after much effort, he fell asleep. But he did not sleep well. Hey, a dance in fire, chapter 3. Only four more to go. So, what have you been thinking about the story thus far? It's quite an adventure at the very least. I'd say it's quite an adventure at the very least. <sighs> Chapter 4 would be the next up by 14 yard. 18 Bosmeri and one Sarantilic former senior clerk for an imperial building commission trudged through the jungle westward from the Silo River to the ancient village of Vindisi. Yay, thanks. The house is looking nice. I did some extra decorations, as I said. Like here. A little bit more light. Silverware, definitely. I won't be eating from anything else than silverware. Little candelier. Eggs, quama eggs in a lovely decorative bowl. A game at diner book is perfect in he my opinion here. And uh, yeah. A few more things added, not a lot. There's the Mehrun's plate and all. But anyways, otherwise at least nice enough. But yes, I shall <laughs> continue. And thank you, Kuzi. Mm. This were the Xyla River to the ancient villas of Vindisi. For Tecumuscotti, the jungle was hostile, unfamiliar ground. The enormous, vermiculated trees filled the bright morning with darkness and resembled nothing so much as grasping claws bent on imped impeding their progress. Even the fronds of the low plants quivered with malevolent energy. What was worse, he was not alone in his anxiety. His fellow travelers, the natives who had survived the Kashiti attacks on the villages of Krenos and Atei, were races of undisguised fear. There was nothing sentient in the jungle, and not merely the mad but benevolent indigenous spirits. In his peripheral vision, Scotty could see the shadows of the Gaishiti following the refugees, leaping from tree to tree. When he turned to face them, the light forms vanished into the gloom as if they had never been there. But he knew he had seen them, and the boss Mary saw them too, and quickened their pace. After 18 hours, beaten raw by insects, scratched by a thousand thorns, they emerged into a wallet clearing. It was night, but a row of blazing torches greeted them, illuminating the letter-fraught tents and jumbled stones of the hamlet of Vindisi. At the end of the valley, the torches marked a sacred site, a gnarled bower of trees pressed close together to form a temple. Wordlessly, the Bosmeri walked the torch arcade towards the trees. Scotty followed them, 
When they reached the solid mass of living wood with only one Caspian portal, Scotty could see a dim blue light glowing within. A low, sonorous moan from a hundred voices echoed within. The Bosmeri maiden he had been following held out her hand, stopping him. You do not understand, but no outsider, not even a friend, may enter, she said. This is a holy place. Scotty nodded and watched the refugees march into the temple, heads bowed. Their voices joined with the ones within. When the last wood elf had gone inside, Scotty turned his attention back to the village. There must be food to be had somewhere. A tendril of smoke and a faint whiff of roasting venison beyond the torchlight led him. There were five Surandils, two Bretons, and a Nord. The group gathered around a campfire of glowing white stones pulling steam in stripes, strips of meat from the cadaver of a great stack. At Scotty's approach, they rose up. All but the Nord, Nord who was distracted by his hunk of animal flesh. Good evening. Sorry to interrupt, but I was wondering if I might have a little something to eat. I'm afraid I'm rather hungry after walking all day with some refugees from Krenos and Athe. They paid him to sit down and eat and introduce themselves. Mm, I'll read the chat quickly. Naturally, only peasants dine with other than silverware. Yes, I was thinking so too. And I ain't no peasant. Well, it's a is no peasant, for sure. We are, after all, an Erevan, reborn and all. So, so the war's begun, it seems, said Scotty amiably. Best thing for this effete do nothings, replied the Nord in between pies. I have never seen such a lazy culture. And now they've got the Kashyyyk striking them a lot, and the high elves at sea. If there's any province that deserves a little distress, it's damnable, Lady Valen Wood. I don't see how they're so offensive to you, laughed one of the Bretons. Their continental tea is even worse than the Kashidi because they are so blessed meek in their aggression. The Nord spat out a cup of fat which sizzled on the hot stones of the fire. They swept their forest into territory that doesn't belong to them, slowly infiltrating their neighbors, and they're puzzled when elsewhere shows back at them. They're all villains of the worst order. What are you doing here? asked Scotty. I'm a diplomat from the court of Chihana, muttered the Nord, returning to his wood. What about you? What are you doing here? asked one of the Surantils. I work for Lord Atreus' building commission in the Imperial City, said Scotty. One of my former colleagues suggested that I come down to Valenfoot. He said the war was over and I could contract a great deal of business for my firm rebuilding what was lost. One disaster after another. I've lost all my money, I'm in the middle of a rekindling of war, and I cannot find my former colleague. Hmm... Your former colleague, murmured another of the Surantils, who had introduced himself as Reclius. He wasn't by any chance named Leodas Euros, was he? Very diplomatic also, very diplomatic. He's a very good diplomat from the north, I'd say. <laughs> you know him. He lured me down to Valenwood in nearly the exact same circumstances, smiled Reclius grimly. I work for your employer competitioner, Lord Fanex's man, where Leodes Euros also formerly worked. He wrote to me asking that I represent an imperial building commission and contract some post-war construction. I had just been released from my employment and I thought that if I brought some new business I could have my job back. Juros and I met in Athey and he said he was going to arrange a very lucrative meeting with the Sylvanar. Scotty was stunned. Where is he now? Ah, no theologian, so I couldn't say. Reckley shrugged. His death, when the Kashiti attacked Ate, they began by torching the harbor where Euros was already in his boat. 
Oh, I should say my boat since it was purchased with the gold I brought. By the time we were even aware of what was happening off the flea, everything by the water was ash. The Kashiti may be animals, but they know how to arrange an attack. I think they followed us through the jungle to Vindisi, said Scotty, nervously. There was definitely a group of something jumping along the treetops. Uh, probably one of the monkey falls, snorted the Nord, nothing to be concerned about. When we first came to Vindisi and the Bosmeri all entered the tree, they were furious, whispering something about unleashing an ancient terror on their enemies. The presence she were to remembering. Uh, they have been there ever since, for over a day and a half now. If you want something to do, be afraid of, that's the direction to look. And the other Breton, who was a representative of the Dakarfall Mages Guild, ooh, Dakarfall, was staring off into the darkness while his fellow provincial spoke. Maybe, but there's something in the jungle to right on the edge of the villas. Looking in. Ooh. Uh, more refugees, maybe? Asked Scotty, trying to keep the alarm out his voice. Not unless they're traveling through the trees now, whispered the wizard. The north and one of the certain hills grabbed a long tarp of wet litter and pulled it across the fire, instantly extinguishing it without so much as a sizzle. Now Scotty could see the intruders. Their elliptical yellow eyes and a long cruel blade catching the torchlight. He froze with fear, praying that he too was not so visible to them. He felt something pump against his back and gasped. Recleus's voice hissed from up, abo up above. Be quiet for Mara's sake and climb up here. Scotty crapped hold of the knotted double wine that hung down from a tall tree at the edge of the dead campfire. He scrambled up in as quickly as he could, holding his breath lest, lest any crumb of exertion escape him. At the top of the wine, high above the village, was an abundant nest from some great bird in a trident-shaped branch. As soon as Scotty had pulled himself into the soft, fragrant straw, Reclius pulled up the wine. No one else was there, and when Scotty looked down, he could see no one below. No one. That is except the Kashiti, slowly moving towards the glow of the temple tree. Thank you, whispered Scotty, deeply touched that competitioner had helped him. He turned away from the willets and saw that the tree's upper branches crushed against the mossy rock walls that surrounded the valley. Valley before below. How are you at climbing? You're mad, said Reclus under his breath. We should stay here until they leave. If they burn Vindisi like they do that Tay and Krenos, we'll be dead sure as if they we were on the ground. Scotty began the slow, careful climb up up the tree, testing each branch. Can you see what they're doing? I can't really tell. Reclius stared down into the gloom. They're at the front of the temple. I, I, I think they have also have, it looks like, long robes trailing off behind them, uh, off into the pass. Scotty crawled onto the strongest branch that pointed towards the wet, rocky face of the cliff. It was not a far jump at all. So close, in fact, that he could smell the moisture and feel the coolness of the stone. But it was a jump nevertheless, and in his history as a clerk, he had never before left from a tree a hundred feet off the ground to a sheer rock. He pictured in his mind's eye the shadows that had pursued him through the jungle from the heights above, how their legs coiled the spring, how their arms snapped forward in an elegant fluid motion to grasp. He leapt. His hand scrabbled for rock, but long thick cords of moss were more accessible. He held hard, but when he tried to plant his feet forward, he slipped up skyward. For a few seconds, 
he found himself upside down before he managed to pull himself into a more conventional position. There was a narrow outcropping jutting out of the cliff where he could stand and finally exhale. Reclius, Reclius, Reclius. Scotty did not dare to call out. In a minute, there was shaking of branches, and Lord Fantasy's man emerged. First, his satchel, then his head, then the rest of him. Scotty started to whisper something, but Reclius shook his head violently and pointed downward. One of the Kashidi was at the base of the tree, peering at the remains of the campfire. Hmm. Reclius awkwardly tried to balance himself on the branch, but as strong as it was, it was exceedingly difficult with only one free hand. Scotty cupped his palms and then pointed at the satchel. It seemed to pain Reclius to let it out of his casp, but he relented and tossed it to Scotty. There was a small, almost invisible hole in the back, and when Scotty caught it, a single gold coin dropped out. It rang as it bounced against the rock wall on the descent, a high, soft sound that seemed like the loudest alarm Scotty had ever heard. <sighs> oh dear, that one gold coin. Then many things happened very quickly. The cat hay rot at the base of the tree looked up and gave a loud wail. The other Kashiti followed in Shoros as the cat below crouched down and then sprang up into the lower branches. Reclus saw it below him, climbing up with the impossible dexterity, and panicked. Even before he jumped, Scotty could tell that he was going to fall. With a cry, Reclus, the clerk, plunged to the ground breaking his neck on impact. I don't think we have a lot of companions that actually survive or stay alive. <sighs> sadness. Very much indeed the sadness. A flash of white fire erupted from every crevice of the temple, and the moan of the Bosmeri prayers changed into something terrible and utterworldly. The climbing Alcate rat stopped, and stared. Keiko, it gasped, the wild hunt. It was as if a crack in reality had opened wide. A flood of horrific beasts, tentacled toads, insects of armor and spine, gelatinous serpents, vaporous beings with the face of gods, all poured forth from the great hollow tree, blind with fury. They tore the Kashidi in front of the temple to pieces. All the other cats fled for the jungle. But as they did so, they began pulling on the ropes they carried. In a few seconds' time, the entire village of Mintise was spoiling with the lunatic apparition of the wild hunt. Lunatic apparitions of the wild hunt. So, also burning fire there. Yep, wild hunt. Where have I heard that before? Mm. <laughs> Over the babbling, barking, howling heart, heart, Scotty heard the siren teals in hide and cry out as they were devoured. The north too was found and eaten, and both presents. The wizard had turned himself invisible, but the swarm did not rely on their sight. The tree the Katerat was in began to sway and rock from the impossible violence beneath it. Scotty looked at the Gashi's fear-struck eyes and held out one of the gourds of moss. The cat's face showed its pitiful gratitude as it leapt for the vine. It didn't have time to entirely replace the decretion when Scotty pulled back the cord and watched it fall. <laughs> so almost like it would have saved one of those cats, but then, nope, not going to actually pull it away from you. And that is very scold from Scotty. Scold, very, very cold, Scotty. What do you wonder, Tayunda? Um, or about the wild hunt. But, uh, yeah, 
the cat's face showed its pitiful gratitude as he slept for the wine. It didn't have time to entirely replace that expression when Scotty pulled back the cord and watched it fall. The hunt consumed it to the bone before it struck the ground. <sighs> Maybe you could have actually gotten a friend from it, Scotty. That might have been okay, even though they were killing a lot. <laughs> yeah, the wild hunt. <laughs> Okay, so Scotty's own jump up to the next outcropping of rocks was immeasurably more successful. From there, he pulled himself to the top of the cliff and was able to look down into the chaos that had been the village of Windisi. The hunts mass had grown and begun to spill out through the pass out of the valley, pursuing the fleeing Kashiti. It was then that the madness truly began. In the moon's light from Scotty's vantage, he could see where the Kachiti had attached their ropes. With a huntress boom, an avalanche of boulders poured over the pass. When the dust cleared, he saw that the valley had been sealed. The wild hunt had nowhere to turn but on itself. Ah, so that happened even though a lot of Kachiti died. Now the wild hunt has to turn on itself because... Their pass is blocked. Interestingly enough, Scotty turned his head, unable to bear to look at the cannibalistic orgy. The nice jungle stood before him, a web of wood. He slung Recluse's satchel over his shoulder and entered. Well, I guess at least he got some new cash. He got Recluse's money. Unfortunately, Recluse himself broke his neck, so, uh, yeah, there's that. <sighs> sadness. Sadness, sadness. We always almost have someone as a companion, and then in the end, nope, taken away. Just like that. But at least we got some more cash. So maybe it was actually a good venture. Who knows? Dance in Fire, Chapter 5. By 14 yard. Soap. The forest will eat love. What? Soap. The forest will eat love. Straight ahead. Stupid. And a stupid cow. Okay. That doesn't make much sense to me, but fine. The voice boomed out so suddenly that Deku Muscotis jumped. He stared off into the dim jungle clade, from which he only heard animal and insect calls, and the low whistling of wind moments before. It was a queer, oddly ascended voice of indiscriminate sender, tremulous in its modulations, but unmistakably, unmistakably human, or at the very least, elven. An isolated bosmer, perhaps, with a poor craft of the Cyrodelic language, after countless hours of bottling through the dense knot of Valenwood jungle, any voice of slight familiarity sounded wondrous. Uh, he hello, he cried. Beatles on any, any, any names? <laughs> Beatles on any names? Certainly, yesterday, yes. The voice called back. Who? What? And when? And mice? I'm, I'm afraid I don't understand, replied Scotty turning towards the bramble tree, thick as a wagon, where the voice had issued. But you needn't be afraid of me. My uh, name is Deku Muscotti. I'm a siren teal from the Imperial City. I came here to help rebuild Phelan food after the war, you see, and uh, now I'm rather lost. Gems, shows and grilled slaves, dot dot dot, the war, moaned the voice and broke down into sobs. The war. All of this. Gemstones and krill slaves. Yes, that's what happened. Fires burned and all. You know about the war? I wasn't sure. I, I wasn't even sure how far away from the border I am now. Scotty began slowly walking towards the tree. He dropped Recluse's satchel to the ground and held out his empty hands. I'm unarmed. I only want to know the way to the closest town. I'm trying to meet my friend, Leodes Euros, in Sylvanar. Sylvanar? 
The voice laughed. <laughs> it laughed even louder as Gothic circled the tree. Worms and wine, worms and wine. Silver sings of worms and wine. So I guess that place is pretty dead if it is a lot of worms and the wine. Unless I could imagine so. There was nothing to be found anywhere around the tree. I don't see you. Why are you hiding? In frustration, born of hunger and exhaustion, he struck the tree trunk. A sudden shiver of gold and red erupted from a hollow nook above, and Scotty was surrounded by six winged creatures scarcely more than a few inches long. Ooh. Bright crimson eyes were set on either side of the tunnel like protuberances, the animals always open mouths. They were legless, and their thin, rapidly beating, hourly wings seemed poorly constructed to transport their fat, swollen bellies. And yet, they darted through the air like sparks from a fire. Whirling about the poor clerk, they began shattering what he now understood to be perfect nonsense. Boys and friends, how far from the border am I? Academic carnismans and alas, Leo de Zirus. Hello, I am afraid, and unarmed. Smoke and flames that closes down is near oblivion. Swollen on bad meat and indigo nimbus, but you needn't be afraid of me. Why are you hiding? Why are you hiding before I began to friend love me, Lady Zuega? Uh, furious with the mimics. Scotty swung his arm, driving them up into the treetops. He stormed back to the clearing and opened up the satchel again, as he had done some hours before. There was still, unsurprisingly, nothing useful in the back, and nothing to eat in any corner or pocket. A goodly amount of gold, he smiled grimly, as he had done before, and the irony of being financially solvent in the jungle. A stack of neat blank contracts from Lord Vanex building commissions, some tin cords, and an oiled leather cloak for bad weather. At least Scotty considered he had not suffered rain. And yes, very much like some very strange dream. Weird dream. I would love to meet those type of mimics that would be just laughing and uh, just mimicking everything that you say in different ways. A rolling moan of thunder reminded Scotty of what he had suspected for some weeks now. He was cursed. That's the obvious solution to the problem at hand. He was cursed. Within an hour's time, he was wearing the cloak and clawing his way through mud. The trees, which had earlier allowed no sunlight in, provided no shelter against the pounding storm and wind. The only sounds that pierced the belting of the rain were the mocking calls of the flying creatures. Flitting just above, babbling their nonsense, Scotty bellowed at them through rocks, but they seemed enamored of his company. While he was reaching to grab a promising looking stone to hurl at his tormentors, Scotty felt something shift beneath his feet. Wet but solid ground suddenly liquefied and became a rolling tide, rushing him forward. Light as a leaf, he flew head over feet overhead until the mat flow dropped and he continued forward, plunging down into a river 25 feet below. The storm passed quite as instantly as it had arrived. The sun melted in dark clouds and formed Scotty as he swam for the shore. Here, another sign of the Kashidi incursion into Ellenfoot greeted him. A small wishing village had stood there once, so recently extinct that it smoldered like a still warm corpse. Dirt cairns that had once housed fish by the smell of them had been ravished. Their pound turned to ash. Rafts and skiffs lay broken, scuttled, half submerged. All the villages were no more. Either dead or refugees far away. Or so he presumed. Something banged against the wall on one of the ruins. Scotty ran to investigate. My name is Tecumu Scotty, sang the first winged beast. I'm a Surrendeal from. 
the Imperial City I came to here to help rebuild Valen Wood after the war, you see? And now I'm rather lost. It's so very funny when our mimics are still accompanying us. <laughs> I swell to Malcolate Apenek, agreed one of its companions. I don't see you, why are you hiding? As they fell into shattering, Scotty began the search the rest of the village. Surely the cats had left something behind. A scrap of dried meat, a morsel of fish sauces, anything. But they had been immaculate in their complete annihilation. There was nothing to eat anywhere. There was nothing to eat anywhere. Scotty did find one item of possible use under the trampled remains of a stone hut. A bow and two arrows made of bone. The string had been lost, lightly burned away in the heat of the fire, but he pulled the cord from Reclus' satchel and restrung, uh, restrung it. The creatures flew over and hovered nearby as he worked. The convent of the sacred Leodes Eurus. The convent of the sacred Leodes Eurus. <sighs> you know about the war, worms and wine, as circumscribe a golden host, Abenek. The moment the cord was taught, Scotty knocked an arrow and swung around, pulling the string tight against his chest. The winged beast, having had experience with archers before, shot off in all directions in a blur. They needn't have bothered. Scotty's first arrow dove into the crowd three feet in front of him. He swore and retrieved it. The mimics, having likewise had experience with poor archers before, returned at once to hovering nearby and mocking Scotty. On his second shot, Scotty did much better in purely technical terms. He remembered how the archers in Falinesti looked when he pulled himself out from under the Hoarvor tick, and they were all taking aim at him. He extended his left hand, right hand, and right elbow in a symmetrical line, drawing the bow so his hand touched his jawline, and he could see the creature in his sight like the arrow was a finger he was pointing with. The bolt missed the target by only two feet but it continued on its trajectory, snapping when it struck a rock wall. Scotty walked to the river's edge. He had only one arrow left, and perhaps, he considered, it would be most practical to find a slow-moving fish and fire it on that. If he missed, at least there was less of a chance of breaking the shaft, and he could always retreat, retrieve it, it from the water. And yeah, very much indeed feels bad, man, for the poor Scotty. <sighs> poor, poor Scotty. Just mimics as friends. If he missed, at least there was less of a chance of breaking the shaft, and he could always retreat from the water. A rather torbid whiskered wish rolled by, and he took aim at it. My name is Dekumu Scotty, one of the creatures howled, frightening the wish away. Stupid and a stupid cow, will you dance a dance in fire? <laughs> oh dear. Scotty turned and aimed the arrow as he had done before. This time, however, he remembered to plant his feet as the archers had done. Seven inches apart. Knee straight, left leg slightly forward to meet the angle of his right shoulder. He released the last arrow. The arrow also proved a serviceable prong for roasting the creature against the smoking hot stones of one of the ruins. Its other companions had disappeared instantly after the beast was slain, and Scotty was able to dine in peace. Oh dear, eating one of those mimics. Honestly, I'm very confused about the story. It's pretty nice to listen to. Very trippy. <laughs> Well, you should have heard a little bit of the time when uh, you missed a certain time frame after all, nonetheless, unfortunately. But uh, it's an interesting story, I would have to say, personally, specifically when you have a context for all of it. But there is some uh, silly stuff like this. This is kind of a very trippy part where there's those sort of kind of like flying mimics flying about next to you and everything. But uh, at least he was able to now then roast one of them, so they weren't able to just roast him. He was able to roast one of them. Hey, hey. Um, 
But anyways... Its other companions had disappeared instantly after the beast was slain and Scotty was able to dine in peace. I'm not sure how you would be able to go and actually eat one of those creatures, but apparently so. The meat proved to be delicious, if scarcely more than a first course. He was picking the last of it from the bones when a boat sailed into view from around the bend of the river. At the helm were Posmer sailors. Scotty ran to the bank and waved his arms. They averted their they averted their eyes and continued past. You bloody callous bastards, Scotty howled. Knaves, hooligan, abenex, scoundrels. A grey whiskered form came out from the hatch. And Scott immediately recognized him as a Criff Malon, the poet translator he had met in the caravan from Surondil. Ooh, I was thinking that we would have to meet Criff Malon again. Criff Malon was the guy who was traveling with us when we originally got um, attacked by the Kashids when we were traveling to the uh, Bosomir city. He peered Scotty's direction and his Eyes lit up with delight. Decoma Scotty, precisely the man I hope to see. I want to get your thoughts on the rather bustling passes in the Noriad play bar. It begins, I went weeping into the world searching for wonders. Perhaps you are familiar with it. I'd like nothing better than to discuss the Noriad play bar with you, Kriv. Scotty called back. Would you let me come aboard though first? <laughs> oh no, it's time for Kruf to die now. Oh, yeah, that's actually true. That's gonna probably happen. We won't be able to have any companions after all. Overjoyed at being on a ship bound for any port at all, Scotty was true to his word. For over an hour, as the boat rolled down the river past the blackened remnants of Bosmeri villages, he asked no questions and spoke nothing of his life over the past weeks. He merely listened to Malon's theories of meretic, admiry, esoteric, es esoteric. It's at least nice that he did keep his word and is trying to help that this guy. The translator was undemanding of his quest scholarship, accepting notes and shrugs as civilized conversation. He even produced some wine and wish jelly, which he shared with Scotty absentmindedly as he expounded on his various cheeses. Finally, while Malon was searching for a reference to some minor point in his notes, Scotty asked, Rather off subject, but I was wondering where we're pawned. Uh, the very heart of the province, Sylvanar, Malor, Malon said, not looking up from the passage he was reading. It somewhat bothersome, actually, as I wanted to go to Woodheart first to talk to a Bosmer there who claims to have an original copy of Tirith Yalimhiat, if you can believe it. But for, for the first time, for the time being, that has to wait. Somerset Isle has surrounded the city and is in the process of starving the citizenry until they surrender. It's a tiresome project, prospect, since the Bosmeri are happy to eat one another. So, there's a risk that at the end, only one fat food elf will remain to wave the flag. <sighs> yeah, it does seem for all the bad luck Scotty has, it always works for the people he meets. Yeah, for sure. He has bad luck, but the people he meets, worse luck. That is vexing, I create Scotty sympathetically. To the east, the uh, it, you are burning everything. And to the west, the high elves are waging war. I don't suppose the borders of to the north are clear. They're even worse, replied Malon, finger on the page, still distracted. The Surandils and Red Guards don't want most more refugees streaming into the provinces. It only stands to reason. Imagine how much more criminally inclined they'd be now that they're homeless and hungry. Oh dear. Border. No crossing the border. So murmured Scotty, feeling a shiver. We're trapped in Valen Wood. Not at all, I need to leave fairly shortly myself, as my publisher has set a very definite deadline for my new book of translations. From what I understand, one merely petitions to the Sylvanar for special border protection, and one can cross into Sorrentil with impunity. 
Petition to Sylvanar. Or Petition at Sylvanar. Petition at to Sylvanar at Sylvanar. It's an odd nomenclature that is typical of this place. Uh, the sort of thing that makes my job as a translator that much more challenging. The Sylvanar, he, or rather they, are closest the Postmeri have to a great leader. The essential thing to remember about the Sylvanar, Malon smiled finding the passage he was looking for. Here, a fortnight inexplicable, the word burns into a dance. There's that metaphor again. What were you saying about the Sylvanar? asked Scotty. The essential thing to remember. I don't remember what I was saying, replied Malon, turning back to his oration. Oh dear, I think we missed something very important that we would actually need to remember about Sylvanar. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> In a week's time, the little boat pumped along the shallow, calmer waters of the flowing, foaming current the Xylo had become, and Decimus Scotty first saw the city of Sylvanar. If Falinesti was a tree, then Sylvanar was a flower, and there's definitely very many interesting places in this Phelan wood. The living the tree, there was a city that was moving that was like a tree, and then a city, Sylvanar, that is like a flower. So very interesting cities. A magnificent pile of faded shadows of green, red, blue and white, shining with crystalline residue. Malon had mentioned offhand, when not otherwise explaining Artemary prosody, that Sylvanar had once been a blossoming clade in the forest. But owing to sun spell or natural cause, the trees sap began flowing with translucent liquor. The process of the sap flowing and hardening over the colorful trees had formed the web of the city. Mao's description was intriguing, but it hardly prepared him for the city's beauty. What is the finest, most luxurious tavern here? Scotty asked one of the Cos Cosmere boatmen. Pritala Hall, Malon answered, but why don't you stay with me? I, I visit an acquaintance of mine, a scholar I think you'll find fascinating. His hovel isn't much, but he has the most extraordinary ideas about the principles of the Meretic Altmeri tribe, the Saramati. <laughs> Under any other circumstance, I would happily accept, said Scotty graciously. But after weeks of sleeping on a crowd or on a raft and eating whatever I could scrounge, I will feel the need for some indulgent creature comforts. And then, after a day or two, I'll petition to Sylvanar for safe passage to Shurandil. The man bade each other goodbyes. Maybe he will actually survive longer than we do. I don't know. Who knows? We'll see. Griff Mullen gave him the address of his publisher in the Imperial City, which Scotty accepted and quickly forgot. The clerk wandered the streets of Sylvanar, crossing bridges of amber, admiring the Petrified Forest architecture. Petrified Forest architecture, interesting. <sighs> but immediately forgetting the publisher and everything, doesn't really want to keep in contact with this guy. Poor Drift Malon, just using him when it's useful, basically. <sighs> like the boat ride and all. Well, at least he did listen to the guy. So I guess that's something. Um, Wandered the streets of Sylvanar, crossing bridges of amber, admiring the petrified forest architecture. In front of a patricolorous achievable palace of silvery reflective crystal, he found Britala Hall. He took the finest room and ordered a gluttonous meal of the finest quality. At a nearby table he saw two very fat fellows, a man and a bosmer, remarking how much finer the food was there than at the Sylvanar's palace. They began to discuss the war and some issues of finance and rebuilding provincial bridges. The man noticed Scotty looking at them, and his eyes flashed recognition. Scotty, is that you? Kinnaird, where have you been? I've had to make all the contacts here on my own. Oh dear goodness. At the sound of his voice, Scotty recognized him. 
The fat man was Leodes Euros, vastly engorged. Well, 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 we finally met with Leodes Euros after all this time. The guy who originally even got us into this freaking place. Well, or met, he recognized us. Oh dear. So, uh, how is this going to go and end? For us, or that guy, who knows? We'll see, I guess. So, chapter 5 read, then the chapter 6 and chapter 7 still left. Let's just go into the chapter 6. So, Decimo Scotti sat down listening to Leodas Euros. The clerk could hardly believe how fat his former colleague at Lord Atreus building commission had become. The piquet picked aroma of the roasted meat dish before Scotty melted away. All the other sounds and textures of Pritala Hall vanished all around him, as if nothing else existed but the vast form of Euros. Scotty did not consider himself an emotional man. But he felt a tide flow over him at the sight and sound of the man whose badly written letters had been the guidepost that carried him from the Imperial City back in early Frost Wall. Where have you been? Eurus demanded again. I told you meet me in Falinesti weeks ago. I was there weeks ago, Scotty stammered, too surprised to be indignant. I cut your nose to meet you in Athea, so I went there, but the Kachitiak burned it to the ground. Somehow I found my way with the refugees in a Nato village, and someone there told me that you had been killed. And you believed that right away, Shira sneered. The fellow seemed very well informed about you. He was a clerk from Lord Fanex building commission named Reclius. And he said that you had also succeeded that he came down to Valen for to profit from the war. Oh yes, said Eurus after thinking a moment. I recall the name now. Well, it's good for business to have two representatives from Imperial Building Commissions here. We just need to all coordinate our bids and all should be well. Reclius is dead, said Scotty. But I have his contracts from Lord Vanex Commission. Even better, Gastures impressed. I never you knew you were a such a ruthless competition, Decomus Scotty. Yes, this could certainly improve our position with the Sylvanar. Have I introduced you to Bash yet? Yeah, uh, we didn't exactly kill this guy, but I'm not sure if we're gonna really say that nope, we didn't actually kill him, he just died for other reasons. Uh, regardless. We are, after all this travel, we're getting back into a rebuilding business, which is very interesting, to be honest. Scotty had only been dimly aware of the Bosmer's presence at the table with Euros, which was surprising given that the mayor's skirt nearly equaled his tiny companion. The clerk nodded to pass coldly, still numb and confused. It had not left his mind that only any hour earlier Scotty had intended to petition the Sylvanar for safe passage through the border back to Surantil. The thought of doing business with Euros after all, of profiting from Valenwood War with Elsewire, and now the second one with the Somerset Isles seemed like something happening to another person. Your colleague and I were talking about the Sylvanar, said Vasht putting down the leg of mutton he had been gnawing on. I don't suppose you've heard about his nature. A little, but nothing very specific. I got the impression that he's very important and very peculiar. He's the representative of the people, legally, physically and emotionally, explained Euros, a little annoyed at his new partner's lack of common knowledge. When they're healthy, so is he. When they're mostly female, so is he. When they cry for food or trade or an absence of foreign interference, he feels it too. And makes laws accordingly. In a way, he's a despot. But he's the people's despot. That's strange. Maybe Tayota should be a benevolent dictator like this. 
<laughs> Maybe you should be a boss mayor <laughs> and start a test mode of uh, this type, the benevolent dictatorship, right? Hmm. When they're healthy, so is he. When they're mostly female, so is he. When they cry for food or trade or, for, or an absence of foreign interference, he wills it too and makes laws accordingly, right? <laughs> That's me, Mela Sumalalta Vitura. Alrighty. Okay. That's good. Now we know your name. You should be called the Sylvanar. That sounds... said Scotty. Searching for the appropriate word. Like punk. Perhaps it is, shrugged Faust. But he has many rights as the voice of the people, including the granting of foreign buildings and trade contracts. It's not important whether you believe us. Just think of the Sylvanar as being like one of your mad emperors, like Pelagius. The problem facing us now is that since Valenwood is being attacked on all sides, the Sylvanar's aspect is now one of distrust and fear of foreigners. The one hope of his people, and thus of the Sylvanar himself, is that the Emperor will intervene and stop the war. Will he? Ask Scotty. You know as well as we do that the Emperor has not been himself lately. Eurus helped himself to regulate his satchel and pulled out the blank contracts. Who knows what he'll do to do, will choose to do or not do. That reality is not our concern, but these blessings from the late good Sir Reclius make our job much simpler. I'm wondering how this is going to end. Yeah, I'm very much wondering about it too. It's very interesting. We'll see. They discussed how they would represent themselves to the Silver Noir into the evening. Scotty ate continuously, but not nearly so much as Euros and Pasht. And I think something important is there that we have missed, still. Considering that the one guy told us that uh, you should remember something very imp important about Sylvanar. And uh, I don't know what that is. I doubt we actually know it yet, so uh, that's a danger thing, I'd say, personally. <sighs> okay. Scotty ate continuously, but not nearly so much as yours and past. When the sun had begun to rise in the hills, its light reddening through the crystal walls of the tavern, Eurus and past left their rooms at the palace. Granted to them diplomatically in lieu of an actual immediate audience with the Sylvanar. Scotty went to his room. He thought about staying up a little longer to ruminate over Eurus's plans, and see what might be the flaw in them. But upon touching the cool, soft bed, he immediately fell asleep. And yep, very risky business is there up to. The next afternoon, Scotty awoke, feeling himself again. In other words, timid. For several weeks now, he had been a creature bent on mere survival. He had been driven to an exhaustion, attacked by several jungle beasts, starved, nearly drowned, and forced into discussions of an ancient art very poetical work. Sasa, this is just as bad as any of the others. Discussions of the ancient alt Mary poetical works are terrible. How could anyone survive it? <laughs> Starvation is a lot easier thing to survive. Uh, the discussions he had with Juros and Pasht about how to dupe the Sylvanar into signing their contracts seemed perfectly reasonable then. Scotty dressed himself in his old patterned clothes and went downstairs in search of food and peaceful place to think. This list was an increasing annoyance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. You're up, cried Bounce upon seeing him. We should go to the palace now. <laughs> Culture. <laughs> now, why Scotty? Look at me, I need new clothes. This isn't the way you should dress to pay a call on a prostitute. Let alone the voice of the people in Valenwood. I haven't even paid it. You must cease from this moment forward being a clerk and become a student of mercantile trade, said Leodas Euros grandly, taking Scotty by the arm and leading him into the sunlit boulevard outside. The first rule is to recognize what you represent to the prospective client and what angle best suits you. 
You cannot dazzle him with opulent fashion and professional peering, my dear boy, and it would be fatal if you attempted to. Trust me on this. Several others besides Pasht and I are guests at the palace, and they have made their era of peering too eager, too formal, too ready for business. They will never be granted audience with the Sylvanar, but we have remained aloof ever since the initial rejection. I've dallied about the court, spread my knowledge of life in the Imperial City, had my ears pierced, attended promenades, eaten and drunk of all that was given to me. I dare say I put on a pound or two. The message I've sent is clear. It is in his, not our best interest to meet. Our plan worked, added Pasht, when I told his minister that our imperial representative had arrived and that we were at last willing to meet with the Sylvanar this morning. We were told to bring you this straight away. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah. Like, actually, we would be ready to meet. Not that they... Not, like, saying that... Asking them to meet us, but... We might be ready to meet you now, willing to meet. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't we late then? Asked Scotty. Very <laughs> laughed Jurus, but that's again part of the angle we're representing. Benevolent disinterest. Remember not to confuse the Sylvanar with convention nobility. <sighs> he is, is the mind of the common people. When you grasp that, you'll understand how to manipulate him. Juro spent the last several minutes of the walk through the city expounding on his theories about that Valen would need it, how much and at what price. They were staggering figures, far more construction and far higher cost than anything Scotty had been used to deal with. He listened carefully. All around them, the city of Silvernar revealed itself. Glass and flower, roaring winds and beautiful inertia. When they reached the palace of the Silvernar, Decimus Scotty stopped, stunned. Juros looked at him for a moment and then laughed. That's quite bizarre, isn't it? That it was. A frozen scarlet burst of twisted, uneven spires as if a rival sun rising. A blossom of size of a village where courtiers and servants resembled nothing so much as insects walk about, it sucking each ichor. Entering over a pent petal-like bridge, the tree walked through the balance of unbalanced walls, where the partitions bent close together, untouched. There was a shade hall, shaded hall or a small chamber, where they were warped away from one another. There was a courtyard. There were no doors anywhere, no any way to get to the Sylvan Arm but by crossing through the endless spiral of the palace. Through meeting the bedrooms and dining halls past dignitaries, consort, musicians and many guards. It's an interesting place, said Past, uh, but not very much privacy. Of course, that's with the Sylvan Arm well. When they reached the inner corridors, two hours after they first entered the palace, guards brandishing plates and bows stopped them. We have an audience with the Sylvanar, said Juris patiently. Uh, this is Lord Tegumoscotti, the Imperial representative. One of the guards disappeared down the winding corridor and returned moments later with a tall, proud Bosmer clad in a loose robe of patchwork leather. He was the Minister of Trade. The Sylvanar wishes to speak with Lord Degumus Scotty alone. Oh dear, Scotty has to be going there alone. That's uh, I don't think he is ready for it, going there completely alone. It was not the place to argue or show fear. Oh, Scotty stepped forward, not even looking towards Eurus and Pasht. He was certain they were showing their mask of benevolent indifference. Following the minister into the audience chamber, Scotty recited to himself all the facts and figures Jurus had represented to him. He willed himself to remember the angle and the image he must project. The audience chamber of the Sylvanar was an enormous dome, 
where the wall spanned from pile shaped at the base inward to almost meet at the top. A thin ray of sunlight streamed through the fissure, hundreds of feet bold, and directly upon the Sylvanar was stood upon a puff of shimmering grey powder. For all the wonder of the city and the palace, the Sylvanar himself looked perfectly ordinary, an average, bluntly handsome, slightly tired looking, extraordinary wood elf of the type one might see in any capital in the Empire. It was only when he stepped from the dice that Scotty noticed an eccentricity in his appearance. He was very short. Oh dear, so short. Mm. I had to speak with you alone, said the Silvanar in a voice common and, un and unrefined. May I see your papers? Scotty handed him the blank contracts from Lord Fanny's building commission. The Sylvanar studied them, running his finger over the embodied seal of the Emperor, before handing them back. He suddenly seemed shy, looking to the floor. There are many charlatans at my court who wish to benefit from the wars. I thought you and your colleagues were among them, but those contracts are genuine. Yes, they are, said Scotty calmly. The Sylvanar's conventional aspect made it easy for Scotty to speak, with warm, no formal greetings, no deference, exactly as Juris had instructed. It seems most sensible to begin straight away talking about the roads which need to be repealed, and then the harbors that the Altmeri have destroyed. And then I can give you my estimates on the cost of resupplying and renovating the trade routes. Why hasn't the Emperor seen fit to send a representative when the war with Elsewhere began two years ago? asked the Sylvanar calmly. Scotty thought a moment before replying of all the common Bosmeri he had met in Valen Wood. The greedy, frightened mercenaries who had escorted him from the border. The hard drinking revelers and expert pest exterminating archers in the western cross of Balinesti. Nosy. Old Mother Pascot in Havel Slump, Captain Palfix, the poor, sadly worn pirate, the terrified but hopeful refugees of Athe and Krenos, the mad, murderous, self devouring wild hunt of the Vindesi, the silent, dour boatman hired by Griff Mullen, the denigrate, Caspin Pasht. In one creature represented their total disposition and that of many more throughout the province. What would be his personality? Scotty was a cleric by occupation and nature, instinctively conferable, cataloging and filing, making things fit in a system. If the soul of Phelan's food were to be filed, where would it be put? The answer came upon him almost before he posed himself the question. Denial. Interesting. I'm afraid that question doesn't interest me, said Scotty. Now, can we get back to the business at hand? Interesting. All afternoon, Scotty and the Sylvanar discussed the pressing needs of Vale and Wood. Every contract was filed and signed. So much was required that there were so many was required and there were so many costs associated that adentums and condicels had to be scribbled into margins of the papers and those had to be resigned. Scotty maintained his benevolent indifference, but he found that dealing with the Silvera was not quite the same as dealing with the simple, sullen child. The voice of the people knew certain practical, everyday things very well. The yields of wish, the benefits of trade, the condition of every township and forest in his province. We will have a banquet tomorrow night to celebrate this commission, said the Sylvanar at last. Best make it tonight, replied Scotty. We should leave for Surantil with the contracts tomorrow, so I'll need a safe passage to the border. We best not waste any more time. Agreed, said Sylvanar, and called for the Minister of Trade to put his seal on the contracts, arrange and arrange for the feasts.
Scotty left the chamber and was greeted by Pasht and Eurus. They basically showed the strain of maintaining the illusion of unconcern for too many hours. As soon as they were out of sight of the gods, they begged Scotty to tell them all. When he showed them the contracts, Bast began weeping with delight. Anything about the Sylvanar that surprised you? asked Eurus. I hadn't expected him to be half my height. Was he? Eurus looked mildly surprised. He must have shrunk since I tried to have an audience with him earlier. Maybe there is something to all that nonsense about him being affected by the plight of his people. I guess that is the case. Well, that succeeded better than I would have expected. It's just a question, how will it get destroyed in the last chapter of the books? I would say that it probably will. Or what do you guys think? And I would assume that Griff will come back to play, somehow, with his translation work. Certainly. Maybe we will actually go and uh, get his translations back into the correct place. Maybe that's the only job that we are able to do. I do not know. Any guesses? How will the story end? Okay. A Dance in Fire Chapter 7 by Vaughn Yard. Saying Sylvanar Valenwood. Date 13, Sun's Dusk. Third Era, 397. The banquet at the palace of the Sylvanar was well attended by every jealous bureaucrat and traitor who had attempted to contract the rebuilding of Vale and Wood. They looked on the Gumbus Scotti, Leodas Eurus and Pash with undisguised hatred. It made Scotty very uncomfortable, but Eurus delighted in it. As the servants brought in platter after platter of roasted meats, Eurus poured himself a cup of yakka and toasted the clerk. I can convince it now, said Eurus. I can confess it now, said Eurus. I had great doubts about inviting you to join me on this adventure. All the other clerks and agents of building commissions I conducted were more outwardly aggressive, but none of them made it true, let alone to the audience chamber of the Sylvanar, let alone brokered the deals on their own like you did. Come, have a cup of yakka with me. No, thank you, said Scotty. I had too much of the truck in Fallen SD and uh, nearly got sucked dry by a giant tick because of it. I'll find something else to drink. Scotty wandered about the hall until he saw some diplomats drinking mugs of a steaming brown liquid poured from a large silver urn. There are seven books, and we are in the last book right now. Dayunda? Scotty, yeah, steaming brown liquid poured from a large silver urn. He asked them if it was tea. Tea made from leaves? scoffed the first diplomat. Not in Valenwood, this is Rotmet. Scotty poured himself a mug and took a tentative sip. It was cami, bitter and sugared, and very salty. At first it seemed very disagreeable to his palate, but a moment later he found he had drained the mug and was pouring another. His body tingled. He's kind of making the same mistake again, drinking two mugs at once. Why can't you be happy with just one cup of that liquid? Why do you have to have so many? <sighs> I don't know. All the sounds in the chamber seemed oddly disjoint, but not frighteningly so. So you're the fellow who got the Sylvanar to sign all those contracts, said the second diplomat. That must have required some deep negotiations. Not at all, not at all, just a little basic understanding of merchandise trading. Grand Scotty, pouring himself a third mug of Rotmet. The Sylvanar was very eager to involve the Imperial State with the affairs of Valenwood. I was very eager to take a person just of the commission. That's the kind of the funny thing, or the thing that he shouldn't be doing. Yeah, is he going to screw up here then? Yeah, probably, because he's like telling all of this stuff to these guys. Is it actually going to be then going through? I am not sure. It's like he's back bragging on it, to be honest. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about this. 
With all that blessed eagerness, it was merely a matter of putting kill to contract bless you. You have been in the employ of his Imperial Majesty very long, asked the first diplomat. It's a bite, or rather a bit more complicated than that in the Imperial City. Between you and me, I don't really have a job. Should he have really thought that, eh? He shouldn't, should he? Nope, that's going to be very bad for him. And yes, very much, way too much fruit. He should be, he shouldn't have drank, he shouldn't have gone, or he should have just stayed with his, uh, so to speak, friends or the trade people that he were, was with who know the truth. <sighs> I used to work for Lord Atreus and his building commission, but I got sacked. And then the contracts are from uh, Lord Fanek and his building commission, because I got them from his fellow Reckless, who is a competitor, but still a very fine fellow until he was made dead by those Khajiitis. Scotty trained his fifth mark. When I go back to the Imperial City, then the real negotiations can begin. Bless you. I can go to my old employer and to Lord Fanek and say, look here you, which one of you wants these commissions? And they'll fall over each other to take them from me. It will be a bit in war for my person, judge the likes of which no one else has uh, nowhere e has ever seen. <sighs> oh dear, so you're not a representative of the Imperial Majesty the Emperor as the first diplomat. Didn't you hear what I said? I said? You stupid, Scotty felt a surge of rage which quickly subsided. He shuckled and poured himself a seven month. The building commissions are privately owned. But they are still representatives of the Emperor, so I am a representative of the Emperor. Or I will be, when I get these contracts in. It's very complicated, I can understand why you're not following me. Bless you, it's all like the poet said, a talent's in fire if you follow the illusion. That is to say, illusion. And yes, Scotty Scotty, you're going to deserve what comes next. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And your colleagues? Are they representatives of the Emperor? Asked the second diplomat. Scotty burst into laughter, shaking his head. The diplomats bade him their respects and went to talk to the minister. Scotty stumbled out of the palace and reeled through the strange organic avenues and boulevards of the city. It took him several hours to find his way to the Pichala Hall and his room. Once there, he slept very nearly on his bed. <sighs> and yes, this train wreck. Like, why? Why go and drink that stuff? You know it's not gonna end well, especially if you are someone who likes to speak the truth. You really think that it's going to fly? Oh dear goodness, oh me. He ruined everything. Uh, the next morning he woke the Euros and passed in his room, shaking him. He felt half asleep and unable to open his eyes fully, but otherwise fine. The conversation with the diplomats floated in his mind in a haze, like an obscure childhood memory. What in Maran's name is Rotmet? He asked quickly. Rancid strongly fermented meat juices with lots of spices to kill the poisons, Miles bashed. I should have warned you to stay with Yakka. So it's even worse stuff. Lovely. You must understand the meat mandate by now, laughed Eurus. This was Mary would rather eat each other than taught the fruit of the wine or the field. What did I say to those diplomats? cried Scotty, panicking. Nothing bad, apparently, said Euros, pulling out some papers. Your escorts are downstairs to bring you to the Imperial Province. Here are your papers of safe passage. I have high doubts about this whole thing. I have high, high doubts. The Sylvanar seems very impatient about business proceedings forward rapidly. He promises to send you some sort of a... Rare treasure when the contracts are fulfilled. See, he's already given me something. Euro showed off his new, bejeweled earring, a beautiful large visited ruby. Bash showed that he had a similar one. The two fat fellows left the room so Scotty could dress and back. I don't trust any of this. I don't trust any of this. Of all, a regiment of the Silver Nars guards was on the street in front of the tavern. They surrounded the carriage, crested with the official arms of Vale and Woods. Still they Scotty climbed in, and the captain of the guard gave the signal. They began a quick gallop. Scotty shook himself and then peered behind. Bashed and Eurus were waving him goodbye. 
wait, Scotty cried, aren't you coming back to the Imperial province too? The Sylvanar asked that we stay behind as Imperial representatives, yelled Leodes Eurus, in case there is a need for more contracts and negotiations. He's, us he's appointed us on trape and some sort of special honor for roaring this at court. Court, don't worry, lots of banquets to attend. You can handle the negotiations with Vanes and Atrus yourself and we'll keep things settled here. I, I don't know about all of this. <laughs> Euros continued to yell advice about business, but his voice became indistinct, bit distant. Soon it disappeared altogether as the convoy rounded the streets of Sylvanor. The jungle, jungle loomed suddenly and then they were in it. Scotty had only gone through it by foot or along the rivers by slow moving boats. Now it flashed all around him in a profusion of cranes. This seems too good to be real, then, still considering all what all he said, truly. The horses seemed even faster moving through underbrush than on the, than on the smooth paths of the city. None of the weird sounds of dank smells with the jungle penetrated the escort. It felt to Scotty as if, we were, as if he were watching a play about the jungle with the background of a quickly moving scream, which offered only the merest succession of the place. So it went for two weeks. There was lots of food and water in the carriage with the clerk, so he merely ate and slept as the caravan pressed endlessly on. From time to time he'd hear the sound of blades clashing, but when he looked around, whatever had attacked the caravan had long since been left behind. At last, they reached the border, where an imperial garrison was stationed. Scotty presented the soldiers who met the carriage with the papers. They asked him a parage of questions that he answers non and then let him pass. It took several more days to arrive at the gates of the imperial city. He did manage to get out of there completely scratch free i'm very 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 surprised i'm extremely surprised i wonder if his friends are actually gonna do as well hmm. the horses that had flown so fast through the jungle now slowed down into unfamiliar territory of the wood and colovian estates by contrast, the cries of his province birds and smells of his province band life brought Deco Scotty alive. Yeah, there's always a twist in these books for sure. But yeah, poor. by contrast, the cries of his province birds and smells of his province plant life brought Deco Scotty alive. It was as if he had been dreaming all the past months. At the gates of the city, Scotty's carriage door was open for him and he stepped out of the uncertain out on uncertain legs. Before he had a moment to say something to the escort, they had vanished, galloping back south through the forest. The first thing he did now that he was home was go to the closest tavern and have tea and fruit and bread. If he never ate meat again, he told himself, that would suit him a very nicely. <laughs> No more meat. Negotiations with Lord Atreus and Lord Fanek proceeded immediately thereafter. It was most agreeable. Both commissions recognized how lucrative the rebuilding of Valenwood would be for their agency. Lord Fanek claimed quite justifiably that as the contracts had been written on forms notarized by his commission, he had the legal right to them. Lord Atreus claimed that Deco Muscotti was his agent and representative, and he had never been released from employment. The Emperor was called to arbitrate, but he claimed to be unavailable. His advisor, the Imperial Battle Mage Jaeger Tarn. Ah, uh, do you guys remember? Do you guys remember who Jaeger Tarn was? This connects exactly to the books of the real Varencia, after all. Remember, Jaeger Tan was the guy who then was indeed, so to speak, the Uriel Septin. That's why he was had been so strange. He wasn't himself at all because he wasn't himself. Jaeger, evil dude, Tarn, yes. And uh, Kai, who also killed the real Parencia's husband, for example, and did all the trickery in that one. So, uh, funnily enough, 
he is very much connected to this book story as well. Kind of uh, very fun and interesting after all. Ah, oh dear. So, his advisor to Imperial Battle Mage Jaeger Tarn had disappeared long ago and could not be called on for his wisdom and impartial meditation. Scotty lived very comfortably off the prize from Lord Atreus and Lord Fanek. Every week, a letter would arrive from Eurus or Pasht asking about the status of negotiations. Gradually, these letters ceased coming, and more urgent ones came from the Minister of Trade and the Sylvanar himself. The War of the Blue Divide with Somerset Isle ended with the Alt Mary winning several new coastal islands from the Wood Elves. The war with Elsewhere continued, ravaging the eastern borders of Valenwood. Still, Vanek and Atrius fought over who would help. One fine morning in the early spring of the year, Third Era, 398, a courier arrived at Decomus Scottis door. Lord Fanek has won to Valen Food Commissions and requests that you and the contracts come to his hall at your earliest convenience. Has Lord Atreus decided not to challenge Future? asked Scotty. He's been unable to, having died very suddenly just now from a terrible, unfortunate accident. Just now from a terrible, unfortunate accident, said the courtier. Okay. Scotty had wondered how long it would have been before the dark. Brotherhood was brought in for final negotiations. As he walked for towards Lord Fanex's building commission, a long, severe piece of architecture on a minor but respectable plaza, he wondered if he had played the game as he ought to have. Could Fane be so rapacious as to offer him a lower presence of the commissions now that his chief competitioner was dead? Thankfully, he discovered Lord Vanek had already decided to pay Scotty what he had proposed during the heat of the winter negotiations. His advisors had explained to him that other lesser building commissions might come forward unless the matter were handled quickly and fairly. Well, that's good to hear for Scotty. I'm just very feeling weird that it's still working out for him so far. Glad we have all the legal issues done with, said Lord Vanek, fondly. Now we can get to the business of helping the poor boss Mary and collecting the profits. It's a pity you weren't our representative for all the troubles with Ben Mach and the Arnisian business, but there will be plenty more wars, I'm sure of that. Oh, in the new war zones, eh? Scotty and Lord Fanek sent word to the Sylvan R that at last they were prepared to honor the contracts. A few weeks later, they held a banquet in honor of the profitable enterprise. Decimus Scotty was the darling of the Imperial City, and no expense was spared to make it an unforgettable evening. As Scotty met the nobles and wealthy merchants who would be benefiting from his business dealings, an exotic but somehow faintly familiar smell arose in the ballroom. He traced it to its source. A thick roasted slab of meat, so long and thick it covered several platters. The cyrodelic revelers were eating it ravenously, unable to find the words to express their delight at its taste and texture. It's like nothing I have ever had before. It's like big fat venison. Do you see the marbling of fat and meat? It's a masterpiece. Scotty went to take a slice, but then he saw something embedded deep in the dried and rendered roast. He nearly collided with his new employer, Lord Fanek, as he stumbled back. Where did this come from? Scotty stammered. From our client, uh, Sylvanar, beamed his lordship. It's some kind of local delicacy they call Urtrapa. Yeah. I don't think this is going to end well. Urtrapa. Scotty vomited and didn't stop for some time. It cast rather a temporary pall on the evening, but when Decum Scotty was carried off to his manor house, the guests continued to dine. The Urtrapa was the delight of all. Even more so when Lord Van Eyck himself took a slice and found the first of two rubies buried within. 
how very clever of the postmare to invent such a dish. The Serentils agreed. What I would assume is that this meat would have been made by those two bodies, as in the two other persons who were left behind into the Sylvanar realm, those two who weren't representatives of the Emperor after all. That's what I assumed. Didn't they get something like rupees? Yeah, the meat is people. That's what I was thinking, that that's the special type of meat that it is. That's, uh, yeah. What a special dish it was, after all. <laughs> well, that's kind of an interesting story. That's how it ends. That's the lovely gift, then. A lovely meaty gift. I'm not sure if it's actually those two representatives, but... Uh, I do also wonder why they spared Scotty. Maybe because they knew that they still needed the contracts. Yeah, and he did tell the truth. He didn't lie like the others. So he didn't pretend. <laughs> well, Bosmers are kind of cannibals, yes. It's no surprise that their special dish would be um, something like this after all. Well, hey, they did enjoy it, so there is that. <laughs> <sighs> Yes. I'm not sure why he was 100% spared, though. I ain't sure. But uh, that was a fun story. Nonetheless, at least from my point of view. What do you guys say? Only took about three hours to read through, so... With a little bit of an occasional other satch. So what say you? Was that a good story or was it not? I can actually put all of this properly here again. Or more properly, anywho's.